Hello everyone, welcome to the first episode of the Games and Rings podcast. My guests today are Pawns and Voice of Geekdom and we see what is going on in this episode today because that is like a premiere. I never did something like this before and just hope that sound and everything will just work fine, nothing glitches out and there won't be too much awkward, awkward silence during the stream. So yeah, maybe um, you guys can introduce uh, yourself a little bit. Let's start with pawns, which people might know, not know, that uh, follow me regularly. Uh, yeah, I, well, I'm pawns, obviously, and uh, I stream full-time here on Twitch, uh, unfortunately, and also do some YouTube stuff from back in the day. People seem to, for whatever reason, know me for some old PBE League of Legends content. I have been uh, desperately trying to move away from that racket for some time now to limit success. And now I'm here to make crap up on this podcast and fill time. Okay, Dan. And, and I'm Dan. I'm My channel on YouTube is The Voice of Geekdom. Um, I also cover Lord of the Rings stuff, and Chris and I know each other through that, through that fandom. Um, but I also used to be a games developer. Um, so I can talk a little bit about that um, in the course of this podcast and um, revisit some of my... Um, misspent youth playing various games as well so i'm looking forward to talking about some games nice that is uh, good to hear also hear that the sound is working well that's good um yeah, that's an interesting uh, combination like um we have like a, f a former um, developer someone from the game industry and um, two people who also cover um, games on my channel i'm chris a philosopher's game so i should also introduce myself for people not knowing me but i Probably if you find found your way here. I'm also doing mainly these days Lord of Rings stuff and a bit of gaming on YouTube. I started as like a YouTube, uh, a gaming YouTuber, and then slowly over time made the transition from, from making f games and a few videos about Tolkien to making a lot of videos about Tolkien, a few about games. That's basically a story behind my channel. Yeah, and I guess what... To, to combine those two um, passions of mine, I decided to start this little podcast series called Of Games and Rings. So we talk about games and, of course, a lot of rings, talking related things. And in the first section, we will talk a bit about um, games and then later move on to the talking related section. I hope we um, can, f well, can find a good balance here. That <laughs> might be difficult, but also try to keep um, track of time. So um, how are people doing? I hope you um, are a bit motivated for this podcast. Are you speaking to the audience or like... Yeah, to you, to you guys, Pawns, <laughs> Dan, how are you doing? Yeah, I'm doing great. I've got caffeine. I'm um, nice and warm and um, ready to get going. <laughs> That's great. Yeah, I'm decently... I don't know. I got a decent night's sleep for once, so I think I'm relatively alert. Well, that's nice. Which we should mention is that we have like a bit of time zone um, problems. Like Pons is uh, nine hours behind me, and Dan is one hour behind me. So yeah, that's a bit difficult. That's also the reason why we start this late in the, uh, for me, late evening. But yeah, it's mainly me causing problems. Yeah. <laughs> I want, don't, don't want to put it like that, but yeah, <laughs> basically. <laughs> but no, it's it's fine. I, I, I also adjusted my sleeping schedule a bit so I can stay uh, awake longer. That should uh, work out. So um, maybe we should look a bit into our um, topics today. Um, we already um, started um, talking a bit about it um, uh, in, the, in the preparation dialogue conversation. And one thing, it's very old news, but um, there are, right now, if you want to get a new graphics card, new GPU, you are having trouble, a lot of trouble. And um, I don't know what um, what's up with you guys. Did you um, plan on getting uh, like one of those new juicy ray tracing GPUs for your computer? And in general, this might be it might also be an interesting question. What is your stance on ray tracing? Have you tried it? Have you seen it? Are you interested in that technology? Well, uh, it's interesting. Um, from a rendering point of view, it's definitely interesting. Um, I don't. I haven't 
used any, I haven't played any ray traced games, so I don't really know how they work. Um, <laughs> but um, I mean, as far as a computer, I want to get a, a nice um, editing computer at some point. So I'm certainly um, worried about getting a, a decent GPU. Yeah, I can totally see that. Pawns, what about you? Uh, yeah, the price hike is a bit unfortunate timing wise for me because my computer is getting pretty old. It's uh, I like to replace it, you know, because of, you know, work once every four to five years. And we're coming up on, I think, five years from mine now. Uh, now, I don't know if it's just like the absolute top tier that keeps getting sold out and sniped by the bots. But either way, I guess I'm probably just going to wait for uh, like, I don't know what. A cryptocurrency crash or something and people stop buying everything up and then maybe i can buy a new computer we'll see yeah not really how this works exactly i do kind of like uh, once every five years or so i do my tech research like hardware research <laughs> so i know what's going on and then i proceed to forget everything after i bought everything so so like, is it mainly is it mainly the cryptocurrency is that the main reason for it yeah, i think that is definitely at least to my knowledge one reason another might be that the vram is um, relatively difficult to produce or to well, i don't know the producer had, has trouble to produce the uh, needed quantity for it and as a result um the developers have uh, the developers the production has trouble getting those um graphic cards out and producing them yeah, I'm, I'm a i'm very interested in cryptocurrency and and this is why i think bitcoin's days are numbered i think i think other cryptos will take over that don't require mining that aren't proof of work cryptocurrencies um, I don't know how much you guys know about this, but yeah. Actually, are, are there other means of uh, acquiring different types of cryptocurrency? I'm not familiar. Yeah, with the... yeah. So not Bitcoin is mined, and it takes a lot of uh, computational power in order to create new bitcoins. Basically, uh, technically, not create them, but to mine them, as they say. And yeah, not every currency is generated in the same way. Um, there are currencies that are pre-mined in advance, and then sold through various different funds and things um so it's it, not every currency has to have this huge carbon footprint that bitcoin has not many people know this um yeah that's true but it's interesting yeah it's interesting i assume they were all acquired in the, the same fashion and now it's it's um, depending on on how the cryptocurrency is designed i think like, yeah, it's not something I've made a very in-depth study on, but I I do know a little bit about cryptocurrency because I do hold some, so I think I've done some research on. Yeah, yeah. I also I did a, a bit of. Oh, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah, I also did a bit of research on. There. I have a friend who's a little bit into it, and sometimes we uh, exchange thoughts about it. Uh, it's kind of interesting, but yeah. Yeah, everybody has that one friend who's just obsessed exactly. with it. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't say he's obsessed with it, but he's definitely interested. Also, does some research, and sometimes we uh, talk. But yeah, probably you are you're right. Yeah, I looked into it a bit recently because I'm tired of being poor. But uh, it's a bit of a pain in the ass to just deal with cryptocurrency from Canada, as far as I can tell, due to regulations and banking stuff. Like it's doable, just extra steps. Yeah, I can totally see this. Well, if, when it comes to what the graphic cards actually build to basically play games where well, you can't say this mm -hmm. i guess but um i definitely um i played um what's it called a cyberpunk 2077 and it runs on my computer i have i'm lucky that my pc is only like three years old but i've spent relatively uh, quite a lot back in the day so it's still relatively good and works and can run it but it's i don't have a ray tracing card in it and to since I couldn't get one, I decided to try um, the GeForce service, um, GeForce Now, where you can activate ray tracing. Of course, um, it's not that beefy. You have to, I don't know, if I if I activate it and have like somewhat, let's call it uh, mid settings, we um, I get like 30 FPS, 40 FPS, in some areas maybe almost 50, something like this. I can turn it off and play it and just on, on high on or ultra and you get 60 so that works too i was actually surprised how well um this service worked i'm it some some it has some problems too but on a on it's really impressive i i for single player games i sometimes don't even notice that i'm playing it like there's a little bit of delay of course but uh, it works uh, impressively well i have to admit 
and it only is relatively cheap in comparison. So I don't feel the need uh, to upgrade if I, at least for single player games to do it. And I have to admit though, that the, the differences are not that great in Cyberpunk um, if you don't look for them. If you just drive fast through the city, you probably won't notice because Ultra also looks pretty good in this game. But when you take time and just look at the reflections and the soft shadows and so on, you definitely see a difference. And um, I don't know, I, I have to admit, I, I like it. It would be great like to get one of those cards and have it run on my uh, computer in a more stable frame rate than, um, I don't know, 30 to 40. That would be uh, great. But I guess um, you guys don't play really many games that, I don't know, actually support ray tracing in any way like leak or i think uh, then i don't even know what ray tracing is so. <laughs> oh that is that's interesting so dan can explain it to you if you want <laughs> um i don't know that i can um <laughs> well i can um i can read you the wikipedia article but i don't think that'll help um i could try to i'm so i was a developer as i said and uh, i i was a programmer but i i didn't really deal with the rendering pipeline very much i was a gameplay programmer okay um it's um yeah ray tracing what it basically does it's an old technology and i don't know i had when i was in i don't know 2005 or so in school i i got a maya and tried to render some scenes and play around with it it's a 3d modeling rendering program that's also used by the industry there's like um, um a version for 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 what do you call it education educational version of it and it also had ray tracing so it was it's a relatively old idea the problem is the it's very um intense to to compute because um while what you do with ray tracing is basically you simulate how the light goes inside a game usually you do a lot of things by um tricking around basically um and in ray tracing you actually simulate how light actually behaves so you a classic example is you have water on the ground and you see a reflection of the environment and it's the actual reflection of the environment and that is of course right. very very computation heavy that's probably the classic example you can of course do this without ray tracing too they are like i don't know some some trickeries you can do like and what is it called um i think it's called screen space occlusion stuff like this or you can just like in old games in deus ex we talked also a bit about deus ex um in the preparation dialogue and there if you look at the mirror you see yourself and it's basically um the, the the image is rendered two times and you see it in the mirror that's how it works there and it you don't see that many mirrors in games because yeah it's really computing ex um, expensive if you um, need to yeah. render everything and, multiple times and usu there, yeah. usually when you do see a, a mirror or any kind of reflection in a game usually it's like a separate camera in exactly. the game world that's rendering to, to a texture yeah it, exactly it's, it, it that's i always assume that how, how it works and it's only in small areas so it doesn't have to do um, that much work but if you going through an open world city and you reflect other cars, the sky and uh, even shadows and lights and whatnot, then uh, things start to become really, really expensive resource wise and you don't do it with trickery, you do it with actually simulating the rays, that's why it's called ray tracing. Um, yeah, it was, of, it, was always, it was always a technique that was used in pre-rendered exactly. animations. So, yeah. you know, it would be in a Pixar movie, but it wouldn't be in a game. Exactly. Is and what, is what we're saying. Recently, um, the 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 technology for GPUs got so good that it's actually able to do this in real time, which is impressive. Of course, um, what the, for example, um, NVIDIA cards do, we see some footage here in the background of um, the presentation of it. They, um, can you see my mouse cursor? No, we can't. Uh, <laughs> And what it basically um, it does is it has like an, a dedicated core to use and to to I don't know power an an AI system that um, is really good at um, rendering or upscaling things. So you render it at a lower resolution, saving resources, upscale it, and if you do it on a certain resolution, you get um, really good results for 
those um, computing processes that are very resource heavy and you don't notice the difference that it's upscaled and it's called uh, DLSS I think and that works actually uh, wonders and it's a reason why it works. Now we see here some, some ray traced footage here from the NVIDIA demo where they showed off the 3000 series here in the background. It's, it's, really, um, it's really impressive what they can do here. I, I think that's actually the old footage. Now they show us the, 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 new, the new beefed up version of it. Maybe we can skip into it. Yeah, this one here. That looks... I'm not sure if you guys have the stream uh, running muted in the background too. In yeah, I can see it. Oh, nice, yeah. I think, yeah, so, I think there's a little so bit that of is, delay, but... Yeah, of course. But that is, yeah, the, the real ray tracing uh, stuff in real time. That's really impressive. And it, it, it it's... It's like a next step you need to to get to photorealism in in games if you ever if you want that. I guess in a in a weird sense, um, and the we also wrote a bit with each other and uh, um, talked a bit. For example, um, I think Pawns played Loop Hero, and that's like the total opposite of this game. Like it's a very um, stylized but retro art style and it's a fantastic little game and it's a ton of fun it doesn't require ray tracing or anything so <laughs> certainly hope not anyway uh, no no it's, i've seen a little bit of it as well i haven't played it but um it, i'd love the art the art is gorgeous yeah exactly so things can be gorgeous even without ray tracing so not that people think that i might think you we need this but still it's an interesting technology and another i guess tool in the in the toolbox of um, developers to make uh, games some games yeah I, I was wondering about that just because yeah i've heard the the term ray tracing over years and years but uh, i just wasn't sure what was going on in this context and why it was such a big deal in terms of you know the discussion of the more recent graphic cards so yeah it's i guess it's a case of real time then yeah exactly the real time and if you want to get a card like this uh, that can do this, you yeah I, I have to pay much, like two times as much as it should cost, and if if not more, and it's really hard to get. What is it called in English? Scalpers, the people that buy everything um, in huge quantities and sell them on eBay and so on. Not sure what the uh, English term. Think think they call assholes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <they're... laughs> That's probably the international term for it. <laughs> but yeah, exactly. It is um, this stuff here. Um, um, I'm, I have to admit, like uh, Cyberpunk also like a game that got a lot of flack for, for things. But one thing it, this game really is, it's really looking great in my opinion. I'm, I'm, I really like sci-fi and cyberpunk as a genre and just walking through the city, seeing this in this um, fantastic uh, visuals, it's a lot of fun to me. It's I, I haven't I haven't had this in in a game for a long time. It's like me going through the cyberpunk city and giggling. It's <laughs> basically uh, that often uh, the times I play it. And I don't know if you can. <laughs> I, I probably not the hugest fan of like walking simulators or anything. But in this game, I kind of. Got the understanding, okay, why why people might like games like these. We just walk around, look at things. Have you uh, followed any of the um, cyberpunk stuff? Like con the controversy around it and so on? Uh, the cyberpunk... So could you repeat the question? Um, did you follow any of the uh, cyberpunk contro controversy and going on around this? Have you, what's your stance on on that game or I don't know? I don't know. I probably have a a weird kind of one-off cynical view because I wasn't really interested in cyberpunk and I knew the claims were extremely inflated. So I was sitting there to myself going, you know what? I hope this game just completely shits the bed. <laughs> Everyone on the internet is pissed off as kind of a joke. And I kind of got my wish, I guess, not to the you know degree I was thinking would be funny, but something along <laughs> those lines is what we got, I suppose. I can uh, definitely, uh, I can definitely see that, and yeah, you you definitely got your wish fulfilled. There's a lot of um, stuff going on with this game, and got a lot of flag, rightfully so. Definitely has uh, a lot of problems. Because see. yeah, I mean, certainly there's like 
you know, the developers over inflating expectations and blah, blah, blah. But at the same time, it's also the community surrounding it, just inflating it up further. It's just kind of a, a feedback loop. So I don't know. I, I kind of don't take the usual, I guess, gamer side, as it were. I feel like people kind of got what they deserve to an extent. Yeah, that is, that might be uh, true. I mean, it also might be an interesting uh, topic and maybe uh, Dan can elaborate uh, a bit on it because the the yeah, marketing, in my opinion, often goes, especially Cyberpunk is a good example for this, often goes into the direction of extreme hyping up things like to, to really absurd amounts of... of uh... Well, I, I do know a thing or two about um, developers who overhype their games. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> that, is, that is true. Um, uh, to explain that in joke, I, I, I was explaining before we started the stream that I used to work for Peter Molyneux. Um, <laughs> so, enough said. Yeah, yeah. I can see that. I'm just doing something in the background in case people wonder. But uh, yeah, maybe you can you can show a bit of the cyberpunk footage here. It's not that it's actually kind kind of difficult to do this on stream, but that should work. Okay, so now we could uh, see a bit of it. It's probably the best footage I have of it, but just took some of my uh, gameplay stuff. Maybe we find something a bit later where I drive around in a motorcycle or something, so we can see a bit of the the area. It's uh, yeah, I don't know. It, there's a lot of stuff going on uh, wrong in this game and it's i don't know the, the the marketing for this game this was hyped up like the game of the um, i don't know century basically and it was really it, like if you look at the version for PlayStation 4 and Xbox 1 i mean it's kind of ridiculous that it runs at all on those machines but it, it's i don't know borderline unplayable there and definitely not finished so many little bugs like animations are missing sometimes you i i just, several times i fell through the floor of the world and so on uh, <laughs> it's it got better with uh, the last patches i have to admit but uh still yeah um, it, it seems to me like a game that was rushed out a bit too quickly yeah definitely yeah. it could yeah, sorry i haven't played it a lot but, but yeah it, it seems like they they needed another six months to a year to finish everything yeah <laughs> I fully agree. It definitely needed um, some additional time to to complete this uh, further. It's it's kind of um, said still. I have to admit, on a, in a weird way, all con controversies um, considered, um, I still have to admit, I, I kind of like it. It's it does some things really well. Let's put it that way. Some things really bad. Some things mm -hmm. really well. And yeah, for some people that um, seem um to work but i definitely uh, yeah, enjoyed my time uh, with it but like i said i'm also a huge fan of cyberpunk the genre itself and it's like a dream walking through like an open world and driving around in in uh yeah cyberpunk futuristic cars and i don't know it's just just gives me a good time driving around through this uh through this world yeah, even if I didn't have any like specific interest in it, overall, like, I'm sure it's a fun game. It seems amusing. Um, although one thing that kind of stood out to me from what little I saw is, and because you do a lot of uh, YouTube editing, right? The um, you know those that sequence or those sequences where you're supposed to recreate what happened in the past through like camera footage or something. Oh yes, the uh, brain dance. Is, I think it's called. To me, that seemed like that was just a YouTube video editor simulator. Am I <laughs> yeah. off on that assessment? Or... Yeah, you. That, that's that's a good way um, to, to put it, I guess. You can you can uh, move forward. You uh, uh, fast forward. You can um, turn the the footage back, but you can also move around freely and have to find clues. So there's a little bit of a detective component. And you have three different visions. You can you have one for for sound sources. One for um, what is it called? infrared so you see a warm signature whatever it's called in english and um one for just visuals and then you can also do some some cyber scanning stuff and you have to find yeah. certain cues for it but yeah basically it, it is you you go around and try to find the the right foot it's basically watching like a 3d youtube video 
just a bit pumped up. You don't really cut footage together there, but yeah, you definitely know what you mean. <laughs> yeah, to me, it just seemed like because there's an audio channel and then there's going to be like a video channel and then there's like a text layer that you can interact with, just kind of that sort of thing. Yeah, exactly. That's that's a good that's a good point of uh, seeing it. Isn't wasn't there? Probably nobody of you knows because it's kind of a specific question. Maybe in chat somebody knows. There was a game. Um, I don't know what it was called, like Remember Me or something. And it was, what was the studio that made it? I, I forgot the name. But it also had something like this already um, in the game. It came out, I don't know, five years ago or something. But I've, I can't remember which studio it was. Let me check if it was a rem Remember Me. Video game, yeah, it was a video game, and it was made yeah by by Don't Not of course Entertainment. It was, it came out 2013, so seven years ago, and I think that it has something similar in it where you could also um, do this, but yeah, I I'm not sure anymore. Um, still, I have to say I, I like the feature, but it's of course heavily scripted, so it's not like it's it's a procedural generate, but it's deliberately um, put into place like to work like this. So, yeah, enough. Um, I don't know. Do you have anything um, to add to this uh, topic? Else we could maybe move to on uh, move on to another topic if you um, want so. Well, were we going to talk about the hacking of CD Projekt Red? Yeah, that's actually um, a good point to um, to to um, yeah continue. It's a good good point. Yeah, we, we could talk about that. So maybe you can elaborate on this um, for a moment. You can also continue the footage. So sure, okay. Um, so, as as most of you probably know, Cyberpunk twenty seventy seven was developed by CD Projekt Red, a Polish game studio, and um, and they were recently, basically, they were hacked, and um, it was like a a scam that they were running where they were trying to basically blackmail the company, um, and CD Projekt, um, as a what they call a ransomware attack. And, and they turned them down. So um, so they released all the source code for The Witcher 3 and for Cyberpunk, etc. cetera, um, which is great, I guess. Um, <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know, you know, why um, anybody would pay to not have that happen. But I suppose, you know the source code doesn't it's, it doesn't really help anybody and it doesn't really hurt the developer that much um it's i mean it's still proprietary software that you can't do anything with really yeah, exactly. uh, maybe I, maybe i'm naive but i don't understand why anybody would pay that ransom um but yeah so that's yeah. what happened um, i don't have any strong opinions on it but I, mean, I think it's always. Um, I think it's several of those ransomware attacks. Um, maybe they are very frequent. I'm not sure, but in the in the in the media, at least on the news, there were several reports of uh, those in the last I don't know twelve months or so. Hmm. So maybe they are ramping up a bit. I don't know why they did it. I had. I, I guess. I guess it's more just bad PR, and um, it's you know it's because um, it wasn't just the game source code either. It was it was like documents to do. Yeah, with also their, no. human resource documents, HR and, so. and stuff. Yeah. yeah. Um, so I guess maybe they've got some dirty laundry there, but I haven't heard any follow up stories to the effect that we found out things about CD projects. By all accounts, they're quite a good company to work for. Um, yeah, yes. no strong opinions on the subject other than hackers too much time on their hands. <laughs> yeah, that, that is definitely true. It's kind of weird. They, they, at least in the West, they can't use it. Maybe there are some countries that have a little bit lax on what you call it copyright uh, and issues and so on. It's, I don't know, maybe they can sell it there and maybe developers there can use the code. I'm not sure. But still, if they would want to release it internationally and uh, with stolen source code it probably would be a big problem i can can't see happening much there i think capcom also got the ransomware attack if i remember correctly and um, a lot of stuff got leaked like um, release dates of of upcoming resident evil games and so on I remember that was also once in the news but a really sad in my opinion it's um, very terrible if it happens to any company and probably the bad PR didn't help um, 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 CD Projekt Red there, but in my opinion, that's 
always bad for for whoever happened. Uh, I mean, it's just it's just terrible if like a attack like this happens and you lose it. On the other side, um, maybe the the damage that was done is um, not that big. Probably a bit of good news for for them. I'm not sure how how they, how they internally see this. It's in my opinion for us at least really hard to evaluate how big did, the did damage you see is. the um did you see the ransom note that the hackers actually sent them? Yeah, I, I saw a screenshot of it. I don't know how much research you put into this story, but but yeah, I saw it. Uh, I looked it up, uh, and um, it's. Do you know what makes me laugh is that hackers always seem to like write these notes, and they always seem to be written by like twelve year olds <laughs> with like tons and tons of exclamation points. <laughs> yeah. I hope these hackers aren't watching this. They might come after me. <laughs> it might be but, possible. But um, yeah, it's. Yeah, it's funny. It's definitely, uh, it definitely is. Somebody uh, wrote a comment. It's like, I don't know, is this from the 90s or something? <laughs> it felt a bit like it, like a 90s hacker movie or so. Kind of funny. But yeah, I don't know. So since we don't have too much, maybe Pawn says something to say. I'm not sure. Don't want to go uh, over you. Nope. So we uh, might, we can probably move on a bit. Um, to another topic that we have on our long, long list. And um, there was the um, incident that the... It's also related to actually um, uh, Cyberpunk, and or to CD Projekt Red to be precise. Um, or the Ori and the Will of the Wisps and Ori and the Blind Forest um, director uh, criticized some developers for overhyping their game. So we are back to the um, hyping topic that we actually mentioned a moment ago. And uh, yeah, it was kind of interesting. I guess a lot of people wrote, yeah, this guy has a point, but he later apologized for basically calling names and um, picking persons. He also, I think, picked uh, Peter Molino. <laughs> yeah, I just read that, yeah. <laughs> He's earned that reputation, but um, it'd be that, you know, he deserves a second chance at some point, Peter Molyneux. Um yeah, uh, I, mean, I guess like so. a third or fourth or possibly fifth. Yeah, That's it would. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I've got no particular interest in defending the guy. Um, I knew him personally for a good long time, and um, I uh, can tell you, he's not a good person. Um, he's a he's a bully and a difficult man to to know and to work with. Um, but as far as the overhyping of games, you know, everybody does it <laughs> to yeah, an that extent. Is... And, and I think you're right that there is a feedback, feedback loop that goes on there as well, to some extent. Um, what you were saying before, points. Oh, yeah. You know, it's, it's, it's the market as well. It's, it's us. It's the gamers. Um, it's, it's, we're responsible for that culture as well, I think. Yeah, that is um, true. But I also think um, that marketing these days, that's, that's called a theory of mine, often, I mean, why why shouldn't they, often goes on a very emotional route to market things. So if you induce emotions into people when they think about a product and you don't deliver, then of course the people will also react emotionally to it. And then often those shitstorms happen and people get really, really angry at um, the developers and um, public uh, publishing companies for not living up to the expectations, maybe. And I feel like that is, it was especially true for um, um, Cyberpunk because they just um, went on and on and um, hyped this game up like the game of the century, basically. And and it then not delivered uh, delivers, and people are especially angry, but. Of course, it also had a lot of faults, um, <laughs> technical problems when it comes to that. On the other side, uh, Ori and the Will of the Wisp, also a really nice game. I only played it like for an hour and really loved it. I've never actually played that one. Uh, it's one of those things where I've seen it stream, so it's kind of difficult to go back and play it because, like, you know, I've already seen it kind of thing. So. Yeah, that is uh, definitely true if you uh, see some games, but... Um, yeah, I have to. I have to admit, it plays so well. Orient the Will of the Wisps. It like sometimes I don't know how some developers are so good at this, but getting the the feeling of controlling a character right and in combination with animation, and Ori does this so well, in my opinion. 
Did you, um, any one of you play um, Hollow Knight by any chance? Oh yeah, that was my favorite streamed game of 2008. I played it a year after it came out, so 2018. Um, I make a bit of a distinction because some games are like a really good streaming experience. They're, I mean, they're good games, but I don't know, something about it just makes it a really positive streaming experience. Yeah. Uh, I quite enjoyed it. Yeah, that I also liked, and um, I would say it's also fantastic. Really a fantastic game, um, Hollow Knight. And Ori, in my opinion, uh, lives up to it a bit, to some degree. I've, I mean, they are not exactly the same game, but very similar. And in that regard, I have to say, um, considering that um, Hollow Knight was also one of the best, um, let's call it Metroidvanias, that I've played in a long time, Orient um, could be up there too, in my opinion. It was a bit overlooked maybe last year. I'm not sure if it's um, because I only played it for, what did I say, an hour or something. I have not played through it yet, so maybe it does not hold up the quality um, until its end, but the, the parts I played, I felt like really, felt like they really nailed it, same as uh, Hollow Knight did. Sometimes do you remember like a game where there was not much hype about, but it turned out pretty good out of your head? Mm. People were surprised by it. You're putting us on the spot here a bit. Um... I, I know there are examples. It's just yeah, it's difficult to come up with off the top of my head. Like maybe um, Mortal Shell? <laughs> It yeah, had, like almost no marketing, and it just yeah, kind of came up out of nowhere. It was decent, although it had some issues, but I thought it was pretty good. Yeah, true. Mm, I th I thought this interesting um topic um Shadow of Mordor when it was announced. I thought, okay, that is like I don't know as Assassin's Creed in the uh, in 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 a, in a Lord of the Ring game disguise it, it it seemed like okay that, that can't be good licensed game licensed games are usually with a big uh, franchise behind are usually not that great and i don't know i have to admit even though the law is wonky in it i have to admit i really liked the game i, I was really positively surprised it's, i'm not sure how hyped people were about it but i felt like hmm, people were a bit skeptical and then turned out pretty good yeah, I recall enjoying that one. In fact, actually, one of your questions earlier before the thing was about like whether or not a Lord of the Rings game was played, and I was struggling to try and come up with one that I had. I forgot about that one. So I have indeed played at least one Lord of the Rings game. Technically two, but that's the other one. <laughs> oh, the other one, yeah, sure. Yeah. yeah, maybe that. I'm not sure um, how the perception was when it came out, if people were, were hyped about it or people were skeptical. I remember being very skeptical myself and also some of my friends too who are into Lord of the Rings, but... Well, you're a, you're a big Lord of the Rings geek, as am I. Um, I, I. I haven't let go of my skepticism. I, I, I don't play Lord of the Rings games, I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, too, I'm too married to the lore as it exists in the books, and I can't do it. I just can't do it. The only game that I think does a good job of the lore is Lotro. Yeah, Lotro's and... online. And I just can't get into the gameplay. <laughs> That's so the I... other one I've played, incidentally. Oh, you also right, played that. Right. So I've played, I've played, I think, three or four hours of Lotro, and I just couldn't get into the spank and tank gameplay, the, the, the WoW-style gameplay of it, um, and the kind of... I just, I'm not an MMO person. I never have been. Um, Saying that, I did get very addicted to Star Trek Online at one point. So oh. I suppose maybe I, I am an... <laughs> I played that too. I, I suppose maybe I am susceptible to the uh, to the MMO addiction, but um, I've always avoided Lotro, actually, for a long time. I avoided it because of the, the danger of getting addicted to it and just losing my entire life to it because it's, it's set in Middle Earth. No, that's definitely but... a thing that could uh, happen. Try to but I, some... I, quick, I quickly decided that this this gameplay isn't good enough for me to get addicted to living in this, to moving into Middle Earth even more so than I already spend most of my imagination, my imaginative life in in that universe. <laughs> yeah, just um, got some footage that... there for the background. Is that one of your videos in the screen there, bottom left corner? Why elves like trees? Oh, I didn't. Uh, yeah, that's actually uh, one of my uh, videos. I, this video had multiple titles. Interestingly, 
Um, I don't know when it started. It was first um, the, the law of the white ring or something, a uh, right tree or something like this. And I was always unhappy with um, with the title of it and I never found it and tried to find something catchy and that was the best thing I could come up with. <laughs> it's kind of it's kind of sad to be honest, but um, I don't know, it's still a um, decently watched video, so can't complain about it. Can you give like a one sentence answer to that question? Why elves like trees? Is that possible? Phew, that's, that's a tough one. That's a long one <laughs> sentence, I guess. So basically when the uh, world when Arda was uh, pretty young before sun and moon were made in the mythology and there were two trees in the world that lighted the world and um, the the elves have a very special connection to those tree and this light which is also connected to the light of the stars and the stars were the first things the elves um looked upon when they awoke because they were lay lying down and seeing the sky and as that they have a deep connection to 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 this kind of light and to um, those uh, trees and that probably goes a bit over to other trees that's really i guess it's the shortest answer i can give probably dennis uh um <laughs> shaking his head not sure no good job um <laughs> yeah that makes sense sentence but it seems <laughs> yeah. pretty good it made sense to me, but it's because I, I know the books as well. So, I'm not sure if that was really understandable, but uh, maybe. I don't know why I'm asking these stupid questions. I'm not the host here. I should probably shut up. <laughs> <laughs> well, maybe you have to, when we come to the Law of Rings um, section, you have to uh, ask the questions, I guess, because, there, of course, Dan and me know like a lot about Law of Rings. And yeah, we will see how, how that will uh, turn out. I can ask lots of inane stuff like metallurgically, what was the exact composition of the one ring? <laughs> <laughs> that, that's probably something we can't answer, I guess. But we could uh, I guess go so. a bit into uh, forging. You're also into um, that's an interesting uh, point about uh, pawns. He's also into you, you're also um, not only into archaeology. Uh, what's it? What is it? I can't say the word archaeology. I can't say it. Can you say it, please? Archaeology? <laughs> yes. Thank you. <laughs> you, um, you studied it, right? Or you uh, yeah, the, worked in the field? The, the degree I never used out once I got my, well, once I finished school. Oh, okay. It's always there. I could theoretically go back to it, but uh, for some reason I decided to uh, go into straving instead. Poor decision, but, you know, whatever. I guess uh, sometimes uh, the passes are complicated in, in life do you um do you have a lot of people tell you that you have a, a dream job that they would love to do streaming uh, i used to hear that more periodically but i complain enough that i, I think uh it just sort of ward off any such commentary at this point <laughs> mm. yeah I, yeah you did preempt me ever saying that to you um <laughs> when you introduced yourself so <laughs> People used to say that to me about working in games um, and working on, you know, I'd, I'd worked in games. I also did stuff, uh, worked on VR and, and AR and apps and things like that. And uh, I hear that a lot. You know, your job sounds really cool. It's honestly, it's a lot of time spent looking at loading screens, sort of crawl across the computer screen. Um, <laughs> yeah, I that kind imagine. of thing. You know, it's it's a lot of waiting around for things or a lot of meetings as well um yeah, i can't imagine yeah. that if you oh sorry pawns go ahead oh no go ahead i can imagine that if you work in this field that um every, basically everything if you have to see it every day especially on a such a broken down level and um when it, mm. you see it most of the time when the product isn't finished and have to basically work towards that it finishes at some point i guess that can be really um, frustrating all too yeah, QA engineers, QA engineers are the ones that I feel really sorry for because they spend all their time breaking games that are half finished, um, and that must get tiresome. It must. It sounds kind you of have, right, you right. have to really love games to be able to do that job. I think. No, I, I can definitely see it. We see a bit of um, um, Lord of Rings online footage here in the background and I'm not into MMORPGs which might be different for you. I, I tried starting multiples and the only I played a bit were um, 
<laughs> also, I played a bit of Star Trek Online, interestingly, but also not that long. And um, a Star Wars Galaxies and Empire Divided. I also played a bit. I like that. Mm. I mean, I never played that one. I, I did play um, The Old Republic. But... Oh, yeah. And I also never tried that one, even though I heard that you can basically play it as a single player game for the most part. Mm. Yeah, I used to be hugely in MMOs before I started streaming. Since then, it's just it's completely stopped because it's kind of difficult to do that. But um, there was a time where, certainly when like the releases weren't as common, I'd basically played every single MMO. Yeah. Early on in the days kind of thing. Maybe one day I'll play another one again. Who knows? Yeah, who knows? You can never say never. MMOs... I mean, I have also friends who are into um, MMORPGs, and currently they are playing uh, World of Warcraft Classic again. Oh yeah, I technically played that. That was something I think maybe you want to talk about later, but uh, yeah, that nearly killed me, so that's not... <laughs> I, I remember that you, when it came out, you, you tried to... Um, you played every day or something? I, I'm not sure what the... Did you have a challenge going or something? I only vaguely remember... Um, that yeah i wanted to hit uh level 60 on a solo warrior in two weeks and i did it but it required about 16 hours a day every single day for that two week duration so okay that sounds a lot of fun <laughs> not like no i felt physically unwell for months after that <laughs> i don't know what it did to my body but it wasn't pleasant yeah i can't imagine that that must it probably destroys you I just thought, okay, it's... you're streaming uh, World of Warcraft again, <laughs> looking up what level you are, but... Yeah. Uh, I think I interrupted you. Go ahead. I No, I'm just watching the um, the footage of Lotro in the background here. Okay. Strider's just shown up with a big sword. Yeah, with a, with a, with a big sword. I do, I do watch um, Corey Olsen play Lotro. Um, that's, so I do kind of play it vicariously. <laughs> Yeah, this one I played briefly when it first went free to play. This That was quite some time ago. So I imagine this footage is probably quite different from what I was used to. But I remember people saying the free to play model was quite stringent with that game. I found it more amusing because it made the game more difficult. And, and I'm weird like that. And I, I don't know. When there's like a free to play model that really wants you to pay money, but you refuse to and make it really difficult on yourself. I feel like I'm saving money and spiting someone, so for me that works personally. But yeah, I can, I can uh, definitely see that challenge um, thoughts behind it. I also did a lot of weird challenges. <laughs> Remember your JRPG? We'll talk about the JRPG ch um, Dark Souls challenge uh, later. So uh, shall yeah, we? I guess from... Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, I suppose from a game developer's perspective, I'm it's a terrible person and not contributing anything. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I can't imagine. <laughs> Shall we uh, move on to another topic? Because we um, yeah, we have a few topics. Actually, we have a lot of topics left. We might uh, pick. Do you have a topic in the list that you might want to talk next about? Uh, well, while we're talking uh, MMOs and touching on Lord of the Rings, maybe we should move on to the Amazon um, MMO news. Um, yeah, the tie in well. It's, uh, but it's up to you. You're the host. Yeah, sure. We can uh, uh, do this. So, um, will you um, explain what the news about? Sure, I'll read. I'll read. Um, I'll read the article that you have prepared for us. <laughs> uh, well, you don't know much about it, really, do we? The um, the Amazon MMO that's coming is. Presumably, it's going to tie in with the Amazon TV show. Uh, we know it's going to be released in 2020. Um, interestingly, there's a quote here in the article that you've linked to us, linked us to, sorry, um, uh, regarding, so it's the head of Amazon's cloud computing division um, is quoted here in this article. Nice. It's is this even relevant to the Lord of the Rings? Hang on. <laughs> I'm reading yeah, that's, this article That's a confusing part. Maybe I, 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 um, looked at, I remember looking a bit into it, and um, oh, Amazon so develops just, two so, MMOs. Okay, I so it just, says, it just says Amazon's next CEO says he's committed to making video games. Okay, so, so okay, fun fact for you about Amazon and video games is they've got their own engine that they've built 
well, I say they've built an engine. It's actually this is the Cry engine that they've yeah, licensed. Yeah, they modified, and add, right? And they've they've added their own tech on top of it, and um, and it ties in it ties in with Amazon Web Services, and it also I think has some sort of integration so that people can. And this this might be interesting to you actually, Pawns, is that they they tied it in with Twitch as well, so that um, viewers of Twitch channels can interact with the game in a meaningful way. And I'm not sure how that works, but and it might just be more marketing hyping. Um, but yeah, I so it'd be interesting to me if the new Lord of the Rings MMO that's being developed by Amazon Game Studios, if it's using their own engine, which is called, what's it called? Lumberjack or something? Lum yeah, Lum no, Lumberyard. Lumberyard, something, something with lumber. Yeah, something like that. Uh, yeah. Maybe maybe somebody in the chat will know. Um, but yeah, so they so they've I think they've only released two or three games um, in the engine so far, and it's they announced it. They first announced it I think four or five years ago, and we're still waiting for you know some big releases on this engine. But but it's freeware, which means it's going to be com competing with Unreal Engine and Unity in theory. So sort of some stiff competition there. Um, but the fact that it ties in with Amazon Web Services makes me think that it might be a natural platform to build an MMO in, or it, or it might be a terrible engine. I don't know. <laughs> Either way, the the Amazon game development studios I find very curious. Again, I don't know much about mm. game development stuff, so it's weirdo outsider perspective. It's just it's very strange. It seems like everything they've done ever has failed, as far as I can tell. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. They haven't had any successes. One of the games that they did make in that engine I just spoke about was the tie-in game with the Grand Tour, which I don't know if you guys know what the Grand Tour is, but it's Oh yeah, this um, um, car thing show, right? Yeah, it's, so it's you know Top Gear, exactly. With yeah. with Jeremy Clarkson and those other two guys who I can't remember their names at the moment. Um, oh, the guy that punched the intern or whatever, wasn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's Jeremy Clarkson. Yeah, he's quite famous here in the UK. Um, yeah, he uh, he punched his like yeah basically his intern um, for like bringing him the wrong meal or or something allegedly. Um, I should say allegedly. <laughs> um <laughs> and um yeah so it was a, it was a tie-in game with that with that show uh which was an amazon prime show um yeah massive failure i just say that was one of the two games that they have actually released in that engine <laughs> oh yeah i feel like that the um situation around this is a bit also confusing like there is the game which i'm seeing the footage right now in the background that is um from i think it's called new world that is also mm. i'm not sure if it's an mmorpg or it's, or it's just an rpg or something something like it's this an MMO, yeah. or an mmo yeah and then they also developed this Lord of the Rings MMORPG, and it has, I think it's, I did some research on it, if I remember it correctly, it started somewhere in Asia, like in China or so, and they wanted to make a Lord of the Rings uh, game, and then they um, basically allied with Amazon to do it, or publish it in the West, or also co-develop it, I don't, I don't know, it's really complicated, I think, we haven't heard, I tried to find footage for it, but I, I haven't seen anything we haven't heard anything about it so all i can um, show right now is this uh, new world footage from the trailer and uh, hope that this uh, fills the gaps to that people can imagine what kind of game they could expect maybe it looks similar maybe some resources of this game also goes over to the lord of the rings thing i can definitely see as um, dan mentioned that it is actually tied to um, the amazon series that uh, will come out maybe next year later this year i'm not sure there's no release date for it so we're just speculating here but that mm -hmm. will come eventually out and well that would, would make sense wouldn't it i mean yeah they've already would... they've already signed a five season deal for the tv show so they are definitely already going to be thinking about things like tie-in games yeah exactly I mean, it is it's very tempting to say that the game is almost certainly going to be awful because they <laughs> nearly always are aren't they but <laughs> But who knows? Yeah, that's definitely true. I mean, yeah, Amazon 
Sorry, go ahead. Yeah, no, go ahead. Uh, I was saying, like, I don't know, Amazon, just as time goes on, they seem to, like, at least in this kind of area of things, they really like to integrate everything. I've been saying for a while now, it's only a matter of time until Amazon really starts getting involved in Twitch and they, it starts to become more of a platform to promote other forms of media and sort of, like, mid-tier TV stars start streaming and that starts to take over things. It's the dark timeline I predicted. But... <laughs> Uh, actually, this uh, the footage currently on the screen. This um, was this one called again? New World. New New World. Yeah, this released a little while back, I think, didn't it? Uh, the footage or the 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 New World game? The actual game itself. Oh, I, I don't know I actually. Like it, I think there was an open then... beta or something for it at some point. But I think I, that's what it was. I think it was a beta. I can, we can look it up if you want. At least I try my best in the short time that is given to me doing this and the problem is the name is a bit um yeah that is video game um release no, it, date, the release date um, 31st august 2021 so uh, yeah. it will be released it was on the a better for it it's but it's relatively um close actually oh, okay okay so yeah i guess i must have seen a beta or something this i don't know everything i hear about this game is kind of strange and i realize everything i'm saying today is negative uh no i don't know maybe i'm in a bad mood or something <laughs> <laughs> um yeah i don't like because i know this game used to be like a big thing in sort of pvp old mmo pvp circles and then they took all the pvp out and that sort of killed interest amongst that sort of crowd um and i was reading some other article about how originally this game was much more about basically killing the this world's native american analogs and no one told them this was a bad idea until they hired some sort of cultural sensitivity group to tell them this is in fact a bad idea you probably shouldn't do that yeah that's so. often a part oh, i also found my note here that i that i wrote so um so that it is made by eslon games and that is part of liu which All is owned by is tencent that... All I know is that antlers are in fashion in this game world, clearly. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Maybe it was a special event or something uh, for this to happen. Kind of fascinating. Yeah, like I said, I'm not into MMO, so I'm not too interested in this, but maybe for the MMO crowd, this might be interesting. But um, we also had yeah, the, the news was like um, Amazon, new CEO, of the um, game studios committed to making or new CEO is committed to making um, video games and so on and there was like what was it called crucible or something that was just a uh, shutdown and yeah, it seems like they as, as Pond said they really failed with so far with uh, what they are doing it shows that you simply can't throw money somewhere if you have, have a lot of uh, resources and then a good game comes out you you have to to make a lot of progress and invest a lot to go on the market. It also ties to like the tries of of uh, Google, which sadly closed down the um, the Google Studios that uh, were supposed to make exclusive games for Stadia. Also, always sad to hear if a studio closes, in my opinion, and people have to find basically new work. But yeah, that was also like a big company throwing a lot of money at it, and then um, they uh, didn't pull through. I I remember Microsoft when they released the, the Xbox, the first one, the big one. <laughs> and how long they also needed to invest and um, throw money at it to, to, to get to the point they are now at. And then with the Xbox One, they maybe demolished their reputation a bit again, but still um, it's there and uh, kicking and probably this generation will be more competitive. Yeah, the, the whole Stadia thing I found very bizarre. Like, I guess the only logic I could think of is it was a long-term play by Google, but yeah, I don't know. Yeah, that's... I mean, it's interesting. I tr uh, You can... St I think the offer is still available, so if you want to try it out, you can register for three months of Stadia. I tried that out and also played a few games. I think I played through uh, SteamWorld Dig 2 on <laughs> Stadia. And I was surprised about the how well the technology worked because it was the first time I ever tried like a cloud gaming service or whatever it's called. And it worked relatively well technology-wise, but um, marketing-wise and bringing this idea to people, they totally failed in my opinion. They failed. The next level failed, you could say. 
lot of people don't know what it is, what it uh, how it works, and so on. And yeah, I don't know. If, uh, is there you... any is there any gameplay in this trailer that we're seeing on screen? Because there seems to be just people running around, just spamming spells at each other, doing nothing. Let me see. Maybe if we skip ahead a bit here, here's something going on fighting wise. Hmm. Have uh, you guys tried out Stadia? And also pawns. I think wanted. I probably interrupted you a bit. No, I, I was just. I like I said. I, I'm more just clueless as to what's going on with that whole thing. It just seemed like a, a, whole, a strange venture on their part. Yeah. Maybe more of a tech demo for the future kind of thing to get established. That's really all I could think of. But that just me, like again, outsider speculation. Yeah. I mean, maybe they. I guess they expected to um, more out of it. Else, probably wouldn't have not have closed. And now it's up into the air if they want to continue the investment. Like if, if they, I, I guess their game studios had like 150 employees or so. So it wasn't that small actually. And yeah, they just dissolved it and no no exclusive games for Stadia, it seems. And that m makes it really hard then, um, I know even harder to sell. Maybe they, I assume they have to change their, their, their idea and model a bit. Maybe they will try to get more games on Stadia as a service and then um, profit on that it's basically very easy to use. You just log in, click on play and the game starts wherever you want. I have to say that worked pretty well. When it works, it really works well. But of course, you also need the internet connection for it. On my end, I like I said, I have on a, on a wired connection with, or do I have 100 Mbits? Uh, it worked pretty, pretty well. I have to admit, at least I could play through this. Steam World Dig is also like a Metroidvania with a bit of platforming and so on that was playable. Lag was a bit noticeable here and there, but still totally fine, my opinion. I guess what what they did not manage to market um, when it comes to Stadia, often I, you read comments like, why didn't they do Netflix for games with Stadia or something like this? But um, the idea, I guess, behind it is you don't have to buy a console, in theory at least, you just need a browser running, can start up um, the, the side of Stadia and click on play and the game runs. Of course, um, if you want to play it on TV, you probably need like this, this Google Chrome thing or whatever it's called um, to work. But uh, it's not required on, on tablet or your laptop or whatever. And you, you don't have you to mean, pay. Um, you mean Chromecast? Yeah, Chromecast, that's the name. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and... You don't have to pay like five hundred um, dollars for PlayStation uh, Five or whatever you pay for it, or for or you don't have to pay like I don't know one thousand something for your, for a new computer to to play it. You can play it uh, pretty well. And yeah, the industry the industry has always made not much for money out of the actual consoles. The consoles yeah. are at a discounted rate. They make the money on the games. Exactly. It's. Um... Um, and, and Skate, Stadia basically skips this console step and just have to run their yeah. servers. And that might run. And if you want to play, it's also free. You just have to buy the game on Stadia. That's probably um, turning some people off because you... And I totally understand this. Like having a physical copy in your um, shelf, maybe a cool edition of it, a collector's edition or whatever. Um, a lot of people um, enjoy exactly that aspect. And uh, with Stadia, it's only on a server and basically in a browser window and you click on it and that's all you get. Of course, probably the same price anyway. So I can definitely uh, see why um, it doesn't work, even though you don't have to buy a console. But when the servers are down, when your internet connection is down, you can't uh, use it. And that's probably a big advantage of for, for consoles in contrast, even though the technology works uh, relatively well, just from that standpoint. I also have to say that state has better, um, at least from my experience, has better um, quality image-wise when it comes uh, compared to GeForce Now, which is basically the same service. The thing what's cool about GeForce Now in contrast is that for that service, I buy it on Steam, and then if the game is supported by GeForce Now, I can play it on GeForce Now, or I can play it, buy it on GOG or whatever uh, store you prefer. I think Epic um, Store works as well. And... That's kind of cool. So I can play it on my computer locally, but I can also play it um, basically, um, I don't know, if I have a good connection on my laptop or on my tablet if I want my <laughs> NVIDIA Shield. That's uh, kind of nice in my opinion. Just buy the game normally, have to pay like a fee every month. I could 
see this actually working for um, Google too, if they would go into a similar direction. Not sure if they will, but that was the reason why I said, okay, I just get Cyberpunk on Steam and then, okay, I don't, if I want to play with Ray Tracing, I can just um, use GeForce Now. And the safe games also transfer over relatively easily. So that is, uh, not easily, automatically, I should say. So I, I was kind of surprised how well that worked. But still not sure if there's a market for it. But now we talked about a totally uh, unrelated topic, I guess. What was the original topic? <laughs> the original? Uh, the Lord of the Rings MMO. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. and Amazon started. and big companies screwing up releasing games. Yeah. That was the original topic. So <laughs> we got sidetracked. I often get sidetracked easily that just happens at times. Do we want to go back to the Lord of the Rings MMO? I mean, we're both Lord of the Rings YouTubers, so we might spend a bit of time on it. Um, yeah, we sure. don't know much. We don't know much. I mean, the only other thing I can share on it is um, it's being developed by a company called Athlon Games, yeah. which we don't know much about them either. Um, I know they're owned by a conglomerate that started off in life as a poultry company in China and then <laughs> somehow moved into video games, which is crazy. <laughs> Um, and they also own Splash Damage, which I actually know somebody who works for Splash Damage. Um, oh, I didn't know that. Splash, what, what did they make again? I, I know the company. but uh, They made the newer Gears of War games. So the Gears of War 4 and 5, I think. Um, uh, what else have they done? Um, they did um, Gears Tactics, for example. The, uh, this yeah. Is, this weird. Uh, actually, it's a good. The... Um... What to call it? It's XCOM with the Gears of War universe, basically. Yeah. Got pre yeah, pretty yeah. good reviews. I haven't played it, though. Yeah, so my friend uh, Anthony worked on that game, actually. Oh, cool. Um, and I'm just looking at the Wikipedia page. Wolfenstein Enemy Territory and Enemy, Enemy Territory Quake Wars. So kind of tactical games that t tie in with other gaming franchises, I guess. Um, oh, yeah, okay, yeah. Things. It's... For something that I've played from that, I have to go way back to, yeah, Wolfenstein and, like, Quake Wars and stuff like that. And Dirty Bond, Dirty Bond, yeah, that's yeah, something Dirty else Bond. that Anthony, Anthony works on, I think. Um, somebody I went to university with. But, yeah, they, they are not involved in the Lord of the Rings game, as far as we know, but they're owned by the same parent company. Yeah, I, I, it's kind of interesting that it's so weird to me that like Middle Earth Enterprises also that the company that um, owns the film and merchandise rights for The Hobbit and um, uh, The Lord of the Rings, which is not to be confused with the Tolkien estates who own every other all the other rights basically, but Tolkien sold yeah, that's off the, the... This, that's the Soul Science company, right? Yeah, exactly. The, Tolkien sold the rights for the film rights for Lord of the Rings and Hobbit back in the 60s or so. He thought, and we'll never make a movie out of that. And yeah, that's the reason why uh, the Tolkien family hasn't the rights for it, which is kind of fascinating. Then this company exists as a sub company of the uh, Salt Sands, whatever it's called, and a company. And yeah, they, they basically license if you want to make a game about Lord of the Rings or that is Lord of the Rings related to some degree. You basically have to get in touch with those guys, but they only have access to um, Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit stuff, so not First Age or whatever. So that would suggest that they are not involved in something that would tie in with the TV show set in the second set in the Second Age. Yeah, that's actually um, a point. I know that at least according, I think it was also on on an article, they are involved, um, definitely are involved in this game. So maybe it won't be, but. If they if they have access to what's in the appendices, maybe they can get a little bit into the second age. I'm not sure if they are involved in the Amazon series too. Actually, I'm like I said, the, the, the right situation is very complicated, yes, and yes. yeah, we don't know have not enough information about it. Yeah, it, it is not that interesting with Lord of the Rings. Uh, it was just like the rights are split up a lot of the time based on the era of the setting, which yeah, exactly. At least well, the, the film rights. I can I can answer this one a little bit actually. So it's it's to do with which primary which text is the primary text for the for the IP that we're talking about. So like, you want to use a particular character if that character mostly appears in the Silmarillion, then that's the text that you need to have licensed. 
which has never been licensed, as opposed to Lord of the Rings. So Lord of the Rings Online can't use a lot of stuff because it might there might be law things that tie in with the Silmarillion, but they don't have the rights to it, kind of thing. Yeah. So, yeah. I mean, on a very sort of small the character appears in multiple eras. Okay. Um, I... Yeah, go ahead. No, can you? Can you, I didn't uh, understand the question acoustically. Can you repeat it? <laughs> oh, like so, if a character is appearing through multiple eras, I, off the top of that, I can't remember anything specific. But say, like, there's a character in the Silmarillion, and there's also a character in Lord of the Rings, and there's, well, I guess, Gandalf would be in all of them. Maybe I don't know, but. Like also in yeah. the Hobbit. Yeah, kind of I mean, there aren't any characters that you could argue are you could argue aren't um, don't have a primary text. So Galadriel appears in the Silmarillion and in Lord of the Rings. Um, she's like a first age character. She's really old, but yeah. she's a Lord of the Rings character. Really, she was invented for the Lord of the Rings, and we get actual story stuff for her in that book. Whereas she's just kind of mentioned as a historical footnote in the Silmarillion. I guess it also that, depends. Oh, sorry. That makes sense. I'm just going to finish. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, it also um, depends, I guess, on the context. Like if you, I guess it would be more troublesome if you make a game where Galadriel appears during the first age than if you make a game where um, Galadriel appears in the third age. I think that might also be a thing to consider. Uh, to to be considered when you look into these licensing licensing issues uh, issue, but like mm -hmm. I said, I'm not one hundred percent sure on that. It's just my imagination how, uh, in theory, it could work. So when yeah, Middle Earth Enterprise involved, I'm not sure how much access they they have to the um um what's it called the Second Age where the Amazon series will play. That. Might I could imagine though? Let's man, we I don't know who the right situation is just complicated because there are licenses for all kinds of things. In theory, if Amazon would have the merchandise um, rights for the Amazon series, maybe, maybe they have to split like give a share to to the Tolkien estate or whatever. Can they? Maybe they are also able to license this further, and maybe they will license because it's it's also developed by Amazon, who has the license. Then maybe they can share it with um, with Middle Earth Enterprises. I can, and there are a lot of factors in, in it that we simply don't know. You see how just complicated it is in, in this mess when you have so many big companies having licenses to specific parts. Yeah, that's probably. Very difficult to to put. Yeah, uh... when you start thinking about this stuff, you you can kind of understand how Christopher Tolkien got to a point where he was just like, All right, "Guys, I'm out. I'm just going <laughs> to yeah. deal with the book stuff." And you know, <laughs> if a new book comes out, we can talk about it. And um, yeah, you know, definitely. He just kind of kind of left the rest of it to. Well, he retired, didn't he? Basically, from his role, so. So uh, shall we uh, move on? Because we are talking already a lot. We have a, still a lot of topics on the list. Probably. Um, is there another um, interesting topic from our news list that we want to... That's actually one I would like to just like to mention because I really find the story pretty cool. A mysterious Street Fighter V player dominates a tournament and donates the winning to charity. That's in my opinion pretty cool. He plays Ryu and that's the most Ryu thing you can do. <laughs> no, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just saying, I'm not actually familiar with which tournament this was. Like, you know, I do some fighting game things, but uh, I hadn't actually heard of that one until you'd mentioned it. Yeah, I think I have a link in it. Maybe I can show it in the background. Let me see. I hope the link is still up because um, sometimes uh, VODs of um, Twitch stuff can get deleted easily. I think that's also the, the final already. I need a moment to set this up. Um, the the, the um, theory is that um, Alex uh, Vaya, I think is his name pronounced, um, was the guy um, playing it. What, my, because it's pandemic, it must be an online tournament, I guess. And yeah, he was basically, could have been it, uh, in disguise. Let me just um, set up um, the background stuff really quick. I'm really terrible at this, I have to admit. Let me see if I can do this really fast. 
and when we might see what tournament it is, because there might be um, the name. There it is. It is WNFF 2021 Online Edition Episode 7. That was uh, the tournament. And here we see um, the players. Maybe we uh, just... Oh, it was a Wednesday night fights thing. Okay. Ah, yeah. Wednesday nights fight thing. Exactly. And yeah, he just um, showed up there. And uh, in the grand final, Rio player was his name. He just uh, dominated. It's a pretty cool story, in my opinion. It's kind of uh, heartwarming. Yeah, I haven't paid too much attention to Street Fighter in a while, so if this was maybe a year or two ago, I might be able to theorize as to who it was or something. But uh, you were floating the idea of Alex Valle, I think. He hasn't... Like, I don't think he's won one of these tournaments in a while. Yeah, that even is... You know, he is a new player. That is... Uh... That is true. There are not that many uh, real players that could have done this, but I don't this know. was before you got buffed. I think wasn't it? Like you yeah, got yeah, buffed very exactly. recently. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so he's uh, kind of good in what he uh, does there. Legendary player. <laughs> I don't know. It's uh, but it's, it's 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 really it's a really cool story in my opinion. Just wanted to mention. There's not much to discuss. It's just a really uh, cool thing to do, in my opinion. I don't know what a, yeah. a charity it does, but that's 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 just. Absolutely fantastic. There were probably a lot of other games going on. Let's see. There's Dependus, I know. I have to admit that uh, that's um, like um, the NA or North America. Yes, NA is North America, I'm an idiot. Um, fighting scene. I'm familiar with one of the, the, the bigger names, but don't watch it uh, exclusively. So sometimes I watch a bit of Street Fighter. Always impressive what um, some people can do there. Yeah, Street Fighter is one of those games where, like, every year or two, I'm like, I want to learn how to play this yeah. game properly, and then I play for a bit, and uh, then remember the net code is complete trash, and then stop within a week. But I hear that's also been improved, at least. Yeah, they also um, patched the game to have um, rollback net code. The problem I heard, what, like I said, I'm not a Street Fighter uh, Five player that plays a lot. From time I try to learn it a bit, but is that it ha usually when you have rollback netcode, we'll talk that uh, about that in a moment, you um, have some rollback frames as basically a, a little um, buffer to smooth out the, the connections and the rollback. And for whatever reason, they thought it's a good idea to um, not implement this here. So when the connection is pretty good, you get a really good rollback experience. But when the connection is a bit wonky, um, your experience suffers a bit of it and... That's what people often complain about. Um, at least that's what I uh, could find there. Well, it's that's really it. hard to get right, though, isn't it, surely? I mean, in, a, in an online game. Yeah. Because we... timing is so important to fighting games. Exactly. That, but, but these. Um... Any, any, any latency is kind of. Now that is, that is the, the magical. We will talk about this um, in the in the next section about Guilty Gear, and its netcode, which is probably Pons and I will agree here. It's really good. Yep. And uh, yeah, that, that's the magic of of rollback netcode, which basically tries to negate the delay by um, guessing what's happening next. We will I will explain try to explain this. Uh, yeah. When we come to the section. I was trying to figure out what that meant actually in prepping for this oh, okay, cool. talk um, because I, I don't know much about fighting games. I played Street Fighter actually when I was a kid, but I think that was the only one I ever got into. Yeah, I've same. Never, never really played any as an adult unless somebody challenges me to one and I button bash my way through it. <laughs> <laughs> um, I only play um, Soul Calibur actively right now, but also really like Guilty Gear, um, the, the, the um, beta or demo, whatever it's called. It was a lot of fun, so I definitely see me um, getting trying to get a bit into Guilty Gear when it comes out. But yeah, we will talk about this uh, in a moment. Just let's finish the uh, news section. Is there? Um, oh, I just did a terrible mistake here. Is there anything um, you still want to add to this, or shall we uh, move on? I'm good. Oh, I did want to answer the question about what charity they donated to. I mean, I don't know which charity, but there was a quote from the winning player who. He said, "Donate it to the homeless." So oh, okay. Presum presumably, a homeless charity. Well, that's cool. That's pretty cool. Really, especially in a time uh, like this, it's uh, 
a heartwarming story. Um, I have a few things marked. Actually, there's also a bigger topic. Um, we have marked still the... Um, there will be a new um, open world third person Dungeons and Dragons RPG that is in development. Dan also marked this topic as potentially interesting to discuss. Yeah, well, I, I mean, I marked it because, just because Dungeons and Dragons games, um, computer games are a big part of what got me into computer games um, in my teens. And the original Baldur's Gate games were amongst those. Um, so I, I will always want to talk about that. You're probably not surprised Tolkien geek into Dungeons and Dragons as well. Yeah, um, <laughs> not a surprise at all. <laughs> um so yeah i marked it as interesting uh again it's this topic that we don't know much about because it's only just been announced but yeah but yeah it'll be interesting it'll be just interesting to see what they're going for it might be something a bit more of an action rpg game i'm i'm speculating here but it, I, i'm i'm guessing it's going to be something a bit less turn-based than Baldur's gate 3 is yeah, um, the dark souls of D D with the uh, dodge rolling mm, yeah possibly yeah <laughs> Let me see if I can bring it up on the screen. But actually, yeah, Baldur's Gate 2, that, that's one of my favorite games of all time. Because, uh, of course, you were asking me about like this kind of favorite games list. I forgot to include that one. That's definitely one of them. Yeah, same. Baldur's Gate 2, Shadows of Arm. Brilliant game. Yeah, I can definitely see that. Uh, also a game I really like. I haven't played in a long time, though. Okay, it would be difficult to get this up here, the... Yeah, me neither. I want to play the remaster of Baldur's Gate 2 at some point, actually. There's a Beam Dog released it for, I think you can play it on like tablet and stuff. Which I can imagine that game playing quite well on a tablet. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that might be worth looking into for myself as well, given how much I enjoyed the originals. Just kind of go through the whole thing again. Yeah, definitely. It's, uh, it's kind of surprising, in my opinion, that there are so little Dungeons & Dragons games. These days, let's put it that way. Back in the day, we probably the, had more. Yeah, like, yeah, nineties there was loads. <laughs> yeah, exactly. There was a lot. <laughs> and it's been a while. I think maybe the last sort of triple A, or not even quite triple A, kind of experienced Dungeons and Dragons game before Baldur's Gate Three. I mean, probably Neverwinter Nights Two. I don't know if there's anything between mm -hmm. that. Uh, no, um, isn't there also a um, 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 Neverwinter Nights online thing? There is, yeah. I haven't played that. Um, I also have not played that. Else, and then there's, there's some games that probably use the system to some degree. Hmm. There was one RPG. It was um, something about a. Oh, what the hell was that? It was. It's one of those top down style RPGs. I want to say it released maybe. Five-ish years ago, I think it became available free through Twitch Prime, and so I think I own it. But Candle Keep something something maybe. I oh, know. Don't ring. Uh, no bell rings here. I have to admit, haven't followed some of the D and D releases. I I know that um, didn't um, Knights of the Old Republic also um, use some of the basically the rule system of. Um, yeah, yeah, kind it, of. It yeah. Does. yeah, kind of. It, 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 yeah, it's called the D twenty system. Exactly, the twenty system, which is a twenty sided dice. Um, so yeah, kind of. It's like it's um, Hotor is based on the D twenty system, which is the system that was developed for th like third generation D and D. Exactly. Um, and it was probably really modified. Not. Like, oh, sorry. Oh, I just I found the game it was Tales from Candlekeep: Tomb of Annihilation, two thousand seventeen. Okay. Candlekeep is the is the starting area in the original Baldur's Gate, Baldur's Gate One. Oh yeah, that was the area that you start in, I think, and then you go back there at the end of the game, if I'm remembering correctly. Well, yeah. I never played the first one. I only played the second one. So right. I also played the first one, but that's a long time ago, a really long time ago. <laughs> yeah, I, I played both games repeatedly so okay. i remember them really well um there's a bunch of different um computer role-playing games that kind of led me down the path of wanting to become a games developer um 
so there's Baldur's Gate and the other big one was Planescape Torment. Oh, which the legendary has, Planescape has Torment. Got, has got just the most brilliant writing you've ever experienced in a video game. Yeah. Um, Did you so, uh, try out, um, what is it called, Tides of Numenera? One yeah, of I played I played that for a couple of hours and lost interest. <laughs> okay. Um, I have it in my library, just, never tried it though. Yeah, uh, it it was supposed to be the same it was supposed to be a spiritual successor but it was in a complete it was set in a completely different setting and it just oh, okay i don't know i didn't really get into it i'll probably try it again sometime but yeah okay. i own it it's part of the giant backlog of games i have to play at some point so i imagine yeah. i'll check it out at some point but <laughs> uh, i also have a lot of games that i own and have not p touched yet it's it's depressing almost but on on a, on a good side, I mean, I have games for years to come, basically. I was just saying, like the bigger RPGs are a bit harder to stream because yeah, it's a lot of text you got to read, and then I, oh, I, yeah. I do these doofy voices, and then my throat starts to hurt after a few hours. So. Yeah, yeah, it's really, <laughs> I really hate it when games are not voiced because, um, like if you stream them and you have to read like for four six hours straight, it really becomes um. You get tired, it's not good for your voice and so on. And you lose concentration, suddenly lose, lose focus, lose the line, uh, misreading things. And it's not my first language and sometimes the fancy writing, I don't know the words or how they're pronounced. Yeah. That makes things uh, very difficult when you want to stream them. Yeah, I was thinking earlier, actually, uh, points you said about um, certain games are good games and other games are good streaming games i was trying to wonder what that meant but um i can definitely tell which what sort of games would be bad for streaming yeah and P planescape torment <laughs> would be near the top of the list there's <laughs> it's just there's just untold amounts of text in that yeah, game. yeah. that is and if you if your channel's like has a certain niche to it then you know, there's variance but yeah kind of like your average twitch stream certain things are very very difficult to stream yeah, definitely um, shall we move on, or do you have something uh, to add? I can't remember, really remember what the topic was, to be honest. It was um, the, the oh. new um, open-world third-person Dungeons & Dragons role-playing game. Oh, right. <laughs> no, nothing to add, no. <laughs> I said we don't know. I, I don't have any footage to show, so i just show you the article no, and show us to IGN. We know, we know nothing. Um, there's speculation that it's being developed in Unreal Engine 4. The developer is called Hidden Path, which I know nothing about them. So I don't know if anybody can shed any light on them. But <laughs> Nope. But that's all we know about the, the announcement. It was only announced a few days ago, by the looks of it. Um, well, I guess vaguely on topic, you guys are talking about how, yeah, I suppose the 90s were sort of like the decade of D&D. &D. And it seemed like to me for the next, you know, starting around mid-2000s for about a decade, decade and a half, that was just like, the major fantasy IP was Warhammer spam, and that seems to have kind of stopped. So maybe it's time for D and D to return. I think it has made a bit of a comeback in the last couple of years. I think um, Stranger Things has been a big part of that because obviously it featured quite heavily in the kind of backstory and plot of that that TV show. Um, I think D and D has made a bit of a comeback. The tabletop game. I hear the fifth edition's been quite popular. Right? I'm not super familiar, yeah. but yeah, that's what I hear as well. Um, I still like kind of third edition Pathfinder and stuff like that myself, and uh, I don't play as much as I would like these days either. Yeah, I hadn't played for I want to say a decade. I just recently joined uh, someone's campaign, like an online one, so it's been kind of neat. The, the new fifth edition, or we're figuring out what the deal with that is. Seems much harder to break the game, but. My guru for um, D and D stuff is a friend of mine in the kind of YouTube community that I know through the A Song of Ice and Fire and Game of Thrones YouTube community. Um, I'll be on his channel at the weekend, so little plug for that. Actually, um, he's uh, his name's Stephen, and he has a channel on YouTube which is uh, Here Be Dragons. He's my guru on um, Dungeons and Dragons, and he swears by Fifth Edition. It's his favorite edition ever. And he's he's older than I am as well, so he's played more than I have. Um, so what's my only my only contribution on that topic? What's uh, kind of interesting, I guess, um, that when we look at the um, tabletop RPGs, that maybe not now in the pandemic, but before the pandemic, maybe it's only a German thing. But um, it felt like in Germany, it got a little. Um, 
not revival is the wrong word, but a little bit of hype, a little boom was going on there and people started uh, to get into a tabletop RPG. Maybe even during the pandemic, just doing it online or so, I'm not sure. But um, I felt like mm. it worked. So maybe, yeah, Pons could be right. Maybe it's time for D&D now after <laughs> a lot of Warhammer. <laughs> Would be cool, definitely. I haven't really heard anybody talk about Warhammer in a long time. Oh, I, have, I have some friends who are deep into Warhammer, so I heard a lot, but it uh, could be my bubble, <laughs> so to say. Hmm. But yeah, let's, let's move on. Uh, control. Have you guys tried the um, like the new Xbox controller or the new, um, what are they called? The DualSense controller, the PlayStation 5 controller, or do you own a, a Switch or something? Because there were a lot of technical issues with those controllers. Like we already he or heard a lot about the problems of drift um, for the um, Nintendo Switch, for the Joy-Cons. Drift is when your character moves even though you don't touch the analog stick because, um, yeah, it's, it's it's a little bit wonky to say. <laughs> to, to, I know how to express it differently. And mm. same was, is, I think, going on with some uh, other controls. Like I, There was also a report of the PlayStation 5 controller having uh, this issue. can maybe show you some, some reveal footage from the PlayStation thing probably the wrong wait where's my obs there it is that sounds infuriating I mean, this is not exactly the same but earlier you were talking about like the controls feel right on on was it the, the ori game yeah the inverse of that when the, the controls don't feel right or characters don't listen to exactly what you say i that's like a personal thing i think it's one of the things i hate most in yeah. games where i can 100 relate to that precise can 100 relate to this especially when i also hate it when games take control of the player like um, I just talked about in my last video about Final Fantasy VII Remake. There's, they have the habit, if you if the game does not want you to go there, it basically makes the UI element saying warning. Then your character slows down and turns around automatically and goes back. It infuriates me, even though there's no reason why I shouldn't go there. It's... I hate this. Sorry, which game was that? Uh, Final Fantasy VII Remake. Oh, okay. Yeah, I watched your video on that earlier. It's, it's, oh, cool. I, I was laughing at that. <laughs> <laughs> it's really, that, that makes me really angry. I hate it. It feels so strange to when suddenly the character's not doing what you want him to do. It's... You, you, uh, you kept showing that shame, say, that same footage of you trying to jump over that box. That's yeah. Great. <laughs> well, also, I think um, I'm not the hugest fan of when games do this. Yeah, but um, I have a PlayStation 5 control. I don't have a PlayStation 5, but... Um, I heard that the controller is really good in your hands and um, thought, okay, why not try it out? And it is, re it just from the feel of it, the PlayStation 5 controller really feels well. But I had the issue after a month or so that when I pressed down, it was the um, square button for me. When I pressed it down, it got jammed a bit and just, or sticky, or I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. And that was really annoying, but uh, it solved itself, so um, the issue is gone now. But that is, that, I never had this with a controller after like a month or so. Maybe on my, even not on my old, I don't know, Super Nintendo controller after five years or so. It maybe felt a bit used, but never had like the, the button stick in. And I'm, then I read online and found that a lot of, uh, several people had problems with it. So I don't know what's going on with the um, hardware controller manufacturing side of things but it seems like there are some issues this generation which is kind of sad even though like i said the controller makes a really good um, impression when i first uh, got him but stuff like this is of course annoying like if the button doesn't register if you don't um, let go of it it's that's just terrible it's just cheap hardware i guess it's probably the yeah. cutting corners and costs and stuff it was interestingly, um, which that, which sorry, which um, controller do you favor though? Do you, Xbox or PlayStation? Which 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 do you prefer? Like the feel of in your I hand, personally basically? the uh, PlayStation controller. I have to admit because I have very very relatively small hands, and for that, mm. um, I think the PlayStation controller is better. Uh, is better. Also, the um, I play fighting games like Soul Calibur. Oh, maybe I have to restart the video here. Um, the um, digi pad of the PlayStation controller is, in my opinion, really good. Not not so good on the um, Xbox controller, even though it's also a pretty good controller. But I feel like for um, for fighting games, or if you want to use the DigiPad, PlayStation controller is a better chance. And now the uh, PlayStation Five controller is also bigger, so and that also works for me. But yeah, I don't know. 
you, I have to admit, I really like my PlayStation 4 controllers. Also, I even like the PlayStation 3 controller. But yeah, I mostly use PS4 controllers and since like a few months, um, PlayStation 5 one. Not sure what's uh, the controller of choice for pawns. Um, I have historically despised all the Xbox controllers. They just feel like, I don't know, these meaty, grotesque things that are just awkward to control. They're really bad for fighting games, too. Like, I yeah. don't like them normally, but using them for fighting games... Like, I don't use a PS4 controller for fighting games either, but at least I can kind of deal with it. Yeah. Um, the Xbox, yeah, I don't like. Though, incidentally, two out of my three PS4 controllers are broken from overuse, probably from when I was speedrunning Dark Souls, because I would just mm. use them so much. <laughs> and then I tried using them for fighting games, and... I kept playing, and then my character would do these weird things that I wouldn't notice in games that are less input sensitive. But you know, you make the slightest mistake in the fighting game, suddenly you're dead, kind of thing. And then, so I was sitting there thinking to myself, I swear, like my back and down key are broken because my character will arbitrarily either duck, like just do a micro duck, or just stop blocking for a split second, which any other game, again, you probably wouldn't notice. Turns out, actually, yeah, they were broken, and they were um, just there's something wrong with the gates. So I use a specialized fighting game controller now, but I quite like the Xbox controllers for FPS games, which I don't play very often. But but the trigger yeah. is nicer. That might be true. I guess also the the even um, marketing wise, I guess the the Xbox also is maybe a bit more shooter heavy with Halo and Gears and so on. Just mm. from the maybe not not by effect, but just from the. I don't know, marketing, I guess, or from the feel. I mean, I yeah, think I about... Oh, sorry. Yeah, just uh, when you think about the Xbox, probably you think about a shooter, I guess. Yeah, it makes sense, because yeah, I wouldn't I think, be really I using think it for what it's intended. Right. Yeah, I think Halo is like the first game that a lot of people think of when they think of Xbox. I think the last console FPS I played was Perfect Dark on... <laughs> what was that, the game... Uh, an N64? It is, yeah. It must be an N64 game, yeah. Which is apparently getting a remake, uh, or re-whatever you want to call it, soon, or something. Much uh, possible. Yeah, N64 from the year 2000. A long, long time ago. Did you have a, you, uh, had, did you guys have a N64 or a PlayStation 1? Or both? I, I, had, I had I had neither actually, but my friend <laughs> my friend had a PlayStation One, which I I went around his all the time to play. It's literally every day, so I kind of feel like I had one. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I was always a PC gamer back then. Yeah, I didn't start really playing PC games till about two thousand. So the kind of deal was it was I mean it was the household and my brother or whatever, but it was more like the PlayStation was mine and the N sixty four was his kind of thing. Oh, okay. Cool. So we had access to both. Yeah, for me it was also um, after the uh, Super Nintendo. Um, yeah, we got my household a PlayStation, and I had a friend who had a N sixty four. So I played some of the games um, there with my friend, and uh, yeah, but mostly uh, yeah the PlayStation one was pretty huge and in parallel also PC gaming a lot. Like I don't know Age of Empires two or something. I really like to play and. The Anno series, like Germans are of course a bit weird when it comes to their simulation games and building strategy, whatever you call them in English. And Anno, Settlers and so on, <laughs> really popular, I like them too. So it was that, but yeah, the PlayStation 1 era was really nice. Also one of my favorite games, Final Fantasy VII, uh, also on PlayStation 1. I even, uh, because Final Fantasy VI did not release uh, in Germany if I'm not totally mistaken, and it released in the United States as uh, states as Final Fantasy III, and so I had to I couldn't play it back in the days. So, uh, I don't know. I was so young uh, the when it came out. Um, it was basically, I don't know if I would import it. It would cost like a fortune simply, and I was too young to speak English anyway, so it was not an option for me to get. I guess I didn't even know that it existed. So and I played it actually on PlayStation One. There was like a release for it. That's where I uh, caught up on Final Fantasy VI. Also, a fantastic game. We like that a lot, a lot too. It was probably my favorite from the series. No, I can totally time. understand that. But that was after I played after Final Fantasy VII, which is kind of weird. Uh, did you play it on the uh, Super Nintendo back in the day, Pawns? Yeah, I had access to like Japanese games back then. So, 
I Let's see. Imported. The grandparents would send over games periodically. You said you also played Final Fantasy VII in Japanese, if I remember correctly. Uh, yeah, no, I played the uh, the original Japanese release, which, as far as I'm aware, is like slightly different, aside from like weird translation stuff. Yeah, like, exactly. The actual content is a bit different from the North American release. Yeah, there are like two optional super bosses. I think those are missing. You see them in a cutscene. I'm not sure if they are were added in into the uh, later two or if they were always there and just the boss bosses as bosses they were missing. I'm not sure, but that should be the largest differences as far as I know. But I'm not too familiar with the Japanese version of Final Fantasy VII. Yeah, I never actually beat seven. This I think was the start of a weird trend with me in games where I'll play things and I don't necessarily dislike them. Like I like them very much. I enjoyed seven, but I got to like the, literally the last boss and then I got busy and did something else. And I was like, eh, I, I basically played through the game. I, I don't gonna bother finishing it. <laughs> so it's just kind of like I don't know. I guess I'm more of a a journey than the destination kind of guy. So yeah, maybe I can see that. So. I, that covers news. Are there any news left that you say, okay, let's talk about that as a last one? If not, we maybe can move on to uh, what have we played? There were a lot of news because I collected news for the last uh, three months or so. So <laughs> a lot of mm. news to talk about. <laughs> Next time you do one of these, you're going to struggle for news then. <laughs> yeah, exactly. We can just recycle topics that we didn't you know, discuss here for the next one. Yeah. I mean, we also... Um, went ahead already and uh, discussed a few things. But um, then I would uh, probably uh, move on a bit. And I don't know, the first topic on the list is uh, Dark Souls 2, which in my opinion is a very fascinating game. Uh, we could talk about that if you guys want. Uh, yeah, I put a good amount of time into it until the certainly the well, ultimately, the third game surpassed in terms of hours put into it. For a while, the second one, I actually had played the most compared to the first one, anyway. I don't know. I It's also my... I played the, the first one the most, the first Dark Souls, and the second one um, the second most. And the third one... Uh, the third most and Bloodborne the least. I think that is my uh, order of it. But I, lo I like all of them, and I really appreciate when it comes to the second game that it's relatively experimental in, in a lot of ways, if that makes sense. Yeah, it seems to have a bit of a... Um, I, I don't know, bad rap is not the exact right word for it. I think it's like people overstate their dislike for it just because it's like... I don't know. I don't know how to phrase it other than it's a weird gamer thing. Because um, you can talk about... Almost kind of like hip streams, like... Like, oh, I'm a Dark Souls 1 player kind of thing. So you just kind of unnecessarily shit on things that don't <laughs> you know, deviate from it slightly. Um, and it certainly does some things that are a bit awkward and not well thought out. But overall, I liked it quite a bit. And what it does well, it does do quite well that you don't really see again for the rest of the, the series. Yeah. I like mean, I like, yeah, sorry, go ahead. Oh, I was just quickly going to say, I like the fact that there's lots of like really rare loot and has that kind of RPG aspect to it, if you really want to get into it and find yeah. everything kind of thing. Um, the power stancing stuff was pretty cool. The PvP, in my opinion, was probably the most entertaining. Yeah. Although PvP is kind of an afterthought in all the games. but I fully agree. Some neat covenants. That stuff was pretty interesting. Yeah, exactly. So... Maybe we should explain uh, covenants in this game. So it's an it's an action RPG. You run around through this. Maybe it's it's just a dark world, a dark fantasy world. That's probably how to describe it. Not sure. Yeah, it's pretty dark. Everything is dead and basically going to ruin in this game. And uh, you play this character, and it's relatively difficult for like a re bigger game. At least at the times these games came out, there are of course more difficult games than than these, but. That's, I guess, always the case with uh, every major release. And uh, covenants in this game basically are, yeah, usually tied to multiplayer, I would say. There are some exceptions to this, of course, and there are some interesting mechanics. For example, a classic example would be there is, you, you can be invaded. So there's the, the PvP element of the game. You walk through the world and then somebody can get into your world, a player, and kill you. 
but then there's a cover he's most likely to do this but not necessary in a in a covenant that supports this invading stuff however there you can also be in a covenant that basically summons a, a player to your side that defends you against invaders and that's how it's one of the um uh, covenant they're, they're multiple there there's some weird stuff in this game when it comes to this and but also interesting and the game is just very experimental i felt in a lot of ways and as pawns already said i fully agree with him there that pvp in this game was really entertaining and entertaining and fun because there were just so many weird builds you could do um, there are so many armors and weapons in this game you can do all kinds of weird uh cosplaying if you want and really wear loot that you it's really difficult to get at times Sometimes also a bit annoying to get to be honest i have like a safe game where i got i think everything except for the two pvp rings where you need like i don't know a bazillion pvp invade wins and um, invasions successfully to get those but i guess except for those i farmed and get everything including the dlc stuff it took me like forever but <laughs> it was uh, still a, a lot of fun and it, it's a fascinating game in that regard you see you're often pretty alone and then suddenly something happens and you almost die that that's what uh, happens a lot in this game especially you, when you you're mentioned new to before it. before we started uh recording we were talking about this uh, that you felt that it kind of changed games yeah um particularly because of the difficulty level and just um how it kind of i think i said that it kind of made difficult games trendy again yeah um but um, are, are you surprised that there hasn't been more kind of clones on the mar in the market, like more copies of it? Because mm. I can't think of that many. Maybe I'm there. Just... There are definitely a few though, and some mm. some better, some worse. Like Mortal Shell that uh, Pawns uh, mentioned a moment ago is also I would consider a clone. Mm. Um, then there's something like Salt and Sanctuary that's like a 2D version that also has some co-op feature, which is kind of neat. Um, then um, from Germany, actually, Germany has sadly a very small development scene. And there's um, Deck 13, as the studio called. They made Lords of the Fallen, which was, I think, one of the first clones. Maybe Pawns. I think that was, yeah. Yeah. And, first uh, yeah. Souls knockoff. <laughs> yeah, the mm. first Souls knockoff. It wasn't that great, to be honest, but... Um, yeah, I don't, don't know if I've heard of that. So there is more than I, th I thought then. Yeah, they definitely had some some hype behind it. I mean... Maybe, I'm not sure if Pawns agrees, but uh, for me, it definitely changed how um, games are uh, percepted. And not just in um, the, the function, but sorry, I don't know, form? I'm not sure if that's the right word, but yeah, just sort of the atmosphere. Like, for example, in terms of an atmosphere, clone is not the right word, but definitely heavily inspired um, by Souls is clearly, um, like we talked about a second ago, uh, Hollow Knight. I yeah. consider that kind of a, a pseudo-Souls-like. Agree. And probably the one that kind of captures the atmosphere the best, in my opinion, at least that I've played. Yeah, 100%. And it, it's fascinating. So um, we talked about this, um, as mentioned before, in the preparation talk. And in 2000, it, Demon's Souls, the first Souls game, came out in 2009. And that was like a time when, I don't know, there was this weird Mario game that had this super guide played itself. I think it was Super Mario Bros. Re or something like that. And you could, if you couldn't beat the level, you could press like a button and then the character would just start playing the level on itself and you could take control back if you wanted or not. Else it would just complete the level for you. And every game had tutorials and to press, uh, to shoot, please press the shoot button and whatnot. It was, I've often felt like, uh, I don't know, a bit annoyed by that trend was also the Wii era so a lot of um, casual players um, or, or develop a lot of companies publishers try to let's call it include more casual players into play and games felt like be became very easy at that time and then Dark Souls or Demon Souls especially came like out of nowhere was a bit of a failed project and um, salvaged by this Miyazaki guy and and his team and uh, became like a little hidden gem, like a cult classic and that did much, much better than they anticipated. And they got a, not a sequel, but um, basically um, a spiritual successor, if you want, because the rights for Demon's Souls are with Sony and uh, Dark Souls then was released for all platforms. So they had to basically create a new IP, but it's 
<laughs> I guess, uh, in a weird way, it's, it's exactly Demon's Souls just with some upgrades. And that was such a huge success. It even got a petition that it got ported to PC and got a really bad PC port, but the people played it anyway and a guy even made a mod to fix it. And it's just a fascinating story if you think about it. And a lot of, suddenly, a lot of games um, pop up and um, cut 2018, I think, um, God of War, the, the last one came out. And it's also inspired by Souls. I find that at that point, when just such a big release and exclusives and for a Sony console is heavily inspired by Dark Souls um, and the combat and how it works and how it feels. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I guess you can definitely see that it inspired um, a lot in the industry and just showed that games that, can, that are difficult, that there's a market for it, especially in the West. And ever since, we also saw more um, games from Japan getting ported and so on to PC or to the West at all. It's also fascinating uh, to see. Uh, it was a discussion in it was in someone's channel. I think it was just his chat. It was excessive profanity. His, he was um, his chat was talking about like if there are any games from kind of roughly this era that will be remembered in the future and have you know this sort of transformative whatever you know thinking back to games from. You know, older ones like, I don't know, anything from Mario to Metal Gear kind of thing that we still remember to this day. And yeah, Dark Souls is the one that people seem to agree on that will just sort of be, I guess, iconic of this time frame. Yeah, definitely. Can you think of any others from kind of 2000s? Or the, the, what do they call the decade after the 2000s? The, uh, the 10s. 2010s, I guess. Yeah, <laughs> 2010s. Yeah. Um, that's a good question. I think there are multiple. I think every genre has uh, made some development in, in some. Uh, Witcher some... 3? Witcher think? 3, yeah. I guess that might be a good example. It's kind of hard to say because it's like who's remembering what from now kind of thing. So, like, yeah. what kids remember nowadays is going to be different from what, like, I don't know, old people like me remember. I don't know how old you guys are, but. In my 30s. <laughs> Same. 33. Almost, okay, so almost, we're, we're, 30, almost 34. We're roughly in the same time frame. So, yeah, I don't know if to, like, I don't know, kids nowadays, maybe, you know, what's going to be considered the big transformative thing was, maybe, I don't know, Fortnite or God knows what, but... Mm, yeah, it's, Fortnite's maybe sure. also, like, a game that could stick out. Also League of Legends, in my opinion. That's probably a game that, maybe for good or, or bad, I'm not sure, but um, that game... Just okay, I've got a good one. I also Mine, have another one. Minecraft. Yeah, yeah, that was the second one that I. <laughs> yeah. That came to That's mind. one that came up in the chat. Yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah, Minecraft. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, the, the League of Legends is a bit of a weird one because it could be, but it also might be a bit of an evolutionary dead end, depending on what MOBAs do. It's hard to say. You yeah. sound very negative about League of Legends. <laughs> yeah, if you have played it multiple years. Um... You can uh, get frustrated by it, to put it um, lightly. I suppose that requires a bit of context. Yeah, I, I streamed a day in and out every day for like eight years, and mm -hmm. I refer to that era as the dark times. So, <laughs> of the dark age. It's, it's a strange concept to grow to hate a video game. Yeah, I, I can't even imagine. I hated it instantly. Like, it, I just as soon as I saw League of Legends, I thought this game is going to give me epilepsy or something. Like. <laughs> Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> For me, it was like I remembered um, the good old Warcraft three days, and remember playing this f these funny little um, uh, maps that you could play there, like Dota, Angel Arena, and whatnot. And I thought, yeah, why, why never somebody made a, a standalone game out of this? And then I googled it and just found, okay, there is um, Heroes of New Earth, there is um, this League of Legends game, and I think Dota two was secretly in development or something came out to 2012 or so, if i remember correctly but uh, pretty late to the party if you uh consider to the other game league of legends came out 2009 in the was in a, at least in the united states in europe it actually hit more like 2010 because of the um there was like something with a service like they had no own service or whatever i'm not i can't remember anymore i play i started playing 2010 and 
uh, tried it out and I don't know I liked the art style I liked um, the build for, that you have builds and um, can play it with your friends I brought my friends to playing it with me and then yeah the dark the dark age started <laughs> also um, Dan seems to have exploded or something oh Dan exploded oh no maybe he has a disconnect or something we lost Dan Please. so we just continue I guess and wait we see if he's back you have like my footage running in the background. Yeah, I have. Um, I Maybe I should explain that you do a challenge run there. That's why you die so much. He does a JRPG <laughs> challenge. A challenge. And yeah, I'm not actually this bad at the game. There's a reason I'm dying repeatedly. Yes. So you can only do an action when this little bar down there um, is filled up. It is not how you play it. It's not a. It plays a turn based basically, and it's not a turn based game. <laughs> so it's incre it needs um, excessive patience, like. Almost, I would always almost say supernatural, um, beyond human patience to to play it like this. I also I realized shortly after this point that um, my OBS overlay was broken, so it wasn't doing all the special effects when we went into combat and stuff. So I don't think that's fixed until like stream two or something. Ah, okay. I just click like random on a on a stream thing of your um, past streams and put it in my document, so I have something to show when we talk about Dark Souls. Okay. Yeah, I got, I've been losing the internet um, periodically over the last few days. Oh, that's definitely. really unfortunate. They put another line in in my building for the people that live upstairs, and ever since then, my internet's been screwing up. So. Oh, no. I'm happy. Um, yeah, I'm moving out soon. So oh, okay. <laughs> so best of luck with your internet, then. <laughs> yeah. It's also, I guess it's everywhere the same. With the Even in Germany, there are some places where internet is absolutely horrible. Not sure how it's in Canada. Yeah, it's like yeah. that South Park episode where um, the internet goes down everywhere and everybody's like migrating out to California to find some internet. Yeah. <laughs> you remember that episode? Yeah. <laughs> and they have to they have to ration use of the internet like every few minutes. I'm quite happy that um, so far the uh, this year internet for me works quite well. Usually it works quite well, but it was different a few years ago here too, so... Let's hope everything keeps keeps running like this. Yeah, where were, where were we actually when you uh, left? I think we talked about a bit about League of Legends, which is somewhat unrelated. Well, we were talking we were talking about games which will be remembered. Ah, in yeah, main future generations. Um, what we were discussing. Yeah, that's. I don't remember, don't remember exactly where we left off. Exactly, League of Legends, Minecraft uh, was of course suggested. Yeah, Minecraft, Minecraft is, was definitely something new when that arrived on the scene. Yeah, definitely. I haven't played Minecraft since like it was in the beta. <laughs> okay, that's <laughs> it was a long like, time ago. When it was a when it was a niche thing, when it was like it, like it, when it was a a kind of um, it was something that gamers only knew about, you know. And now it's like you know it's on lunch boxes and stuff. Mm -hmm. It seems seems really weird to me that it was this thing that I I thought that I was a hipster for playing it um, when it came out ten years ago. So also, yeah, that that game came a really long way. Yeah, that's my primary context to the game as well. I think like what was it um, the survival mode had just been released or something? That's also like ancient history. Yeah. Yeah. Same. Yeah. I played it actually last year. Sometimes friends of mine have like, okay, let's play Minecraft or play this because we can play it together. That's kind of cool. And sometimes you struggle finding games that all people have and like and everyone has Minecraft basically. And then we sometimes play it a bit and then we lose interest after like a week or so. That's always how it happens. But um, still, um, kind of impressive how the game uh, developed and you can... I have a lot of fun installing like shader mods and so on and make the game look pretty good. Like in this weird pixel the, style. Can you get ray tracing and that? <laughs> yes, you can. That's uh, in the you official can. Minecraft um, 10 version, Windows 10 version f of Minecraft, you can activate a ray tracing. And there's also for the Java version a, a mod that I think we have to actually pay money for it. Like it's a donationware thing or whatever. And it's a shader mod, and you can activate ray tracing, and it looks pretty impressive, but probably also eats quite a lot of resources. But it, in my opinion, it's impressive that people modded this into the game, but I, modding community is, of course, huge for this. And that's also one of the um, games. When when did um, Skyrim come out? Was it in the 2010s? 
Skyrim. Okay. It's also like uh, like another game with a big modding community. It's uh, let me check really fast. 2011. It came out. Okay, it's in 2010. Yeah, I was gonna say early 2010s. Yeah. Yeah. So that it's another Skyrim, game probably. Skyrim, I don't think counts because it it basically was just another game in the same series that was just just another Elder Scrolls game that hasn't it. I don't think it's revolutionized anything. Yeah, then it, it's, it's maybe true, it's, but it, it's, it holds... a, it's a game. It's a game with a huge fan base that holds a special place in a lot of people's hearts. But no, I don't true. think it. I think it actually it streamlined elements from the previous games in the series, and it kind of took things out rather than bringing anything new. Yeah, yeah, yeah. agreed. Um, my old man opinion is uh, Morrowind is still my favorite. <laughs> <laughs> See, that's a bit, a little bit like people that like Dark Souls one the best, the hipster crowd, <laughs> something like that. Yeah, but but um, uh, I like Dark yeah, Souls one the most. You're probably right. <laughs> um, I I actually I I don't really like Elder Scrolls games as RPGs. They're not RPGs; they're hiking simulators because you don't you don't do any role playing in these games. They're just. Oh, that's definitely a. Uh... And there are there are other games, other games that are similar that I I like more as well. Stuff like Mountain Blade and stuff like that. Oh yeah, Mountain Blade. Similar. Um, it's a game I haven't played in a while. That was fun. Yeah. It was. It's a really addicting game. You're probably getting the sense that I'm really into fantasy stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, I do. I do like other things. We mentioned Deus Ex earlier. Um, yeah, it was a fantastic game. That's obviously a it game that's remembered fondly, and that's obviously much. It earlier, was ahead but... of its time. Yeah, in so many ways. I tried to stream that a while back. It was right after I'd played System Shock Two for the first time, and I was like, "Okay, let's um, transition right into Deus Ex," but it wouldn't run on my computer properly. Oh. So, uh, yeah, that, that needs a bit of uh, tuning to to get it run. Can run there some some mods that. I guess I needed for it, but yeah, it can be a pain to bring it to uh, to run. Yeah, it probably wouldn't be too difficult. It was just I was in the middle of the stream and I was like, yeah, yeah of course, and right you now, don't so. want to fiddle with technic st mm -hmm. technical stuff. Yeah, it was a few years ago now, wasn't it? Where um, all of a sudden, half of YouTube started changing their um, their avatars on YouTube, their little pictures on YouTube to pictures of the uh, JC Denton character in Deus Ex. Okay. Uh, did, did you not see this? <laughs> and it was some it was some big YouTuber who apparently asked all his followers to change their um, avatars to that picture for some reason. And yeah. for a long time I didn't I didn't lock on to, you know, that that had happened. Um, there was some sort of I don't know why, but it was some sort of like social media campaign. It was some really really big YouTuber. I can't remember who, but um, and I kept seeing people in comment sections on YouTube with Deus Ex pictures, and I kept commenting like, "Oh, you like Deus Ex? I... <laughs> you remember that game? Okay." And it's it's not. It's just this little kids who have never played Deus Ex and have no idea what it is, but. But I can't remember which YouTuber it was that, that asked people to do that. I'm going to look it up now. <laughs> Interesting. I've, I've not uh, noticed that one or didn't heard of that one. That you still see people on YouTube with the picture. With yeah, that sometimes picture. you, you do, just, actually. I got some comments. You put a comment and thought, okay, maybe that's the, that's the same. Oh, he likes Deus Ex, same like me. But maybe it's just from this um, thing then. Yeah, it was like a meme, I guess. Mm. Um Kind of. Um, really interesting. Yeah, but uh, to maybe come back to uh, Dark Souls 2, what I really appreciate is that it ex experimented quite a lot. Like, uh, compared to Dark Souls 1, they nerfed or made a lot of things weaker. For example, the roll at the beginning, they tied it to a stat now, the amount of iframes you get. And See, that I didn't like. I thought that was janky. But... Yeah, it probably was, but I, I like the the idea of experimenting with it. I it probably didn't work out so well. But um, on the other side, I have to admit though, when you have like um, a low level character and have no iframes at all, like eight or so compared to your fourteen or what you have in Dark Souls One, um, 
<laughs> and you and you dodge something it feels like okay this was like perfection and feel feels kind of great even though of course it feels um a bit uh, janky but uh <laughs> it also you know okay I, i achieved something here with perfect timing it's uh that that i liked they i don't know they nerfed the, the shields they nerfed um how, how you regenerate in the game like estus doesn't fill up your health almost instantly anymore but takes quite some time I like that one because yeah, they yeah. had uh, ramifications for PvP as well. So exactly, that that worked uh, quite well for uh, for PvP stuff. And what else did they did they uh, change? They changed the parry, which was also pretty broken in the original uh, game, at least against parable enemies. And it wasn't that the timing of it wasn't that difficult, and dealt a ton of damage. If you um, were good at this timing, you were basically. Uh, <laughs> basically unbeatable with it you also got iframes they also nerfed a lot of the iframes like door opening and i basically when you open a door you can't get um damage in in dark souls 1 but in dark souls 2 you uh you still can get damage or if you repost somebody stuff like this backstabbing they even built in rings that prevented you from getting or i think it was an armor set that prevented you from getting a uh, backstabbed i also like that one And for PvP, they made that some heavy uh, weapons, when you two had them, you can't parry them anymore. And for PvP, that was, in my opinion, a really smart decision. So you have to, if you want to parry your enemy, you have to think, okay, he's one-handing this weapon, I can parry him. Now, it required some some knowledge and thinking, and the enemy could play with this a bit. They could go on some mind games here and there. Stamina um, con consumption was absurd in Dark Souls 2. Like you see this one hit and you lose like almost a third of your stamina. It is uh, pretty heavy. I mean, Dark Souls uh, 1 also had like high stamina use. But Dark Souls 3, in contrast, like you do what you can roll like 12 times in a row when you're out of stamina or something. Yeah, a lot of the thing, a lot of those changes actually made the challenge run in this game specifically that I'm doing in the background the, the, the second game just harder than the other ones i wasn't quite expecting it it made yeah, the beginning of the game really difficult actually yeah absolutely like this is brutal i, I did a level one run as a challenge run so not leveling through the whole game and play through it and it was brutally hard it was i also did it for dark souls one and it was in comparison easy but yeah because of the the lack of the iframes because i did the soul level one for dark souls 2 as well and it was um oh. that was actually the first challenge run i ever did which is maybe not the best place to start <laughs> yeah, because... probably. <laughs> yeah, but it's, it's always kind of interesting how okay you played through it and then you play again and notice okay isn't, isn't that difficult anymore because you know the game you know how to level you know where, where to put the stats where to find the weapons that they're good and um, then you th maybe some people then start looking at new challenges and um, dark souls a lot of stuff can be quite fun to do like a bow only uh, run or whatever but i interrupted until... you oh uh yeah until very recently there's something else came up but for years the longest i had ever spent on a single encounter was yeah my dark souls once or dark souls 2 soul level one challenge run on the fume night <laughs> about nine hours on that guy oh yeah uh that is um that is yeah that, that guy is a uh, pretty pretty tough it's one of the most difficult bosses in um, dark souls 2 for people who uh, don't know the game he's part of the second dlc so it's um, pretty high level content if you have not leveled against this guy you are you have to play him perfectly there's no room for error i guess there's a yeah. there's an interesting thing about very very difficult games because a, a lot of times when you do get stuck on a on a boss like that like a nine hour slog to beat one character to resolve that encounter it can feel painful when you're playing it like, yeah but actually they've done studies on this and you know i i studied computer game design at university that was what my un undergraduate degree was in and they've done studies on this and actually uh, there's a whole like thing where like there's a massive like lump of dopamine that gets pumped into your brain when you lose in a game and when you when you feel like you're getting frustrated you're actually having your, the most fun um <laughs> it's it's weird but they've proven it <laughs> you know um they've done they've done cat scans of people playing games and um 
and experiencing that sort of that rage and frustration of losing over and over again and it's actually it's people enjoy it they just aren't admitting it to themselves somehow it's interesting uh, like gamer masochism kind of i can definitely see that when you then overcome the challenge it's like the best feeling ever mm. at least in some case sometimes you also feel empty and dead after it but <laughs> yeah another game that is very very difficult that i love um it was a game that i spent a lot of time with anyway it was ninja gaiden 2 mm -hmm. do you guys remember that game i know the first ninja gaiden from the nes no so this is like uh, this is like early 2000s maybe or mid 2000s are these the, like um, the playstation like, 2 games i think like like xbox 360 era oh, playstation 3 it was yeah, yeah and xbox yeah um so that game was extremely difficult a kind of similar kind of mechanics to dark souls a little bit actually was yeah, it I... the one made by team ninja yeah i think so okay the, the neo people then okay i've yeah. heard about them but i've never played them so, yeah so that game was very very difficult and i remember i remember getting so angry play, trying to beat the bosses <laughs> so it was so <laughs> difficult <laughs> Um, and it was kind of you had to time the like dodges perfectly to counter attack to really do any damage to these bosses and if they hit you once you know you lose half your health it's like of course you turn the difficulty up they one shot you practically um, you know the bosses were just ridiculously difficult but but also a fantastic game in some ways because it's just such a good feeling when you beat that boss and yeah. have no health left at the end of the fight that's true i mean ninja gaiden always had the history of being difficult when we talk about mm -hmm. cyber shadow oh uh, maybe we could move to cyber shadow if, if uh, we want or maybe just let's just mention it here uh, in this section um it also i guess is very reminiscent of the first uh, ninja gaiden games that are the the 2d platformers on nes and so on which are also brutally difficult. I never played through the first Ninja Gaiden. I, I tried. And then I came to this, this stupid ladder with a bird. And I could just... It was basically a skill check and I failed. <laughs> and then I, I gave up at some point. Because playing through the level was already not that easy. And then... Oh yeah, I guess it was not that difficult. But the stupid ladder. You climb up and get hit by the bird. You fall back and fall down and have to do it again. Mm. It's... And sure, if, uh, have you played the Ninja first Ninja Gaiden uh, pawns? Nope. Okay. But you played a Cyber Shell. It's pretty similar, probably less streamlined, but also a fantastic game, though. It's a really cool game, but brutally difficult in, in that regard. So there were probably always um, difficult games around, even as you mentioned, like this was, um, I don't know when it came out, the Ninja Gaiden, but probably far before Dark Souls. And still i guess the the to come back again to what what's so special about dark souls it made it popular it, um like it's a very well-known game it's like uh like a lot of memes that a lot of people know like some people say yeah this is the dark souls of whatever genre stuff like this and that's so that's yeah, really 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 interesting uh serious in that regard also dark souls 2 here as we see it it's it's a pretty long game like there's a lot of content in it probably not all the content is great not all the bosses are great but still there's a lot to do in this game as, as we mentioned because this game has so many little experiments going on um, reducing the power of a lot of things especially the early levels are really brutally difficult when you do a challenge run that's kind of and never felt maybe if only for dark souls uh, one because i really like that game a lot probably for some nostalgic regions i guess uh, at least i don't know did how, did you do a lot of runs uh, challenge runs for dark souls 3 because i never felt the urge to do challenge runs a lot in dark souls 3 um i probably ultimately ended up doing the most of the other yeah, weird challenges in dark souls 3 i think oh, okay interesting so maybe it's just uh for me always yeah, like I I think this whole series comes down to which one you like is personal preference because it's all over the place. Like I'll even see people who like the second one the best because so, I think I like the third one the best overall. Yeah, I can uh, totally see they're all very good games in my opinion. On each on their own. Yeah, there's like, you know, depending on how you qualify it, I could 
really define any of the, the series as maybe my favorite, but if you just kind of take it in a total sense, probably yeah. the third one for me. I mean, what um, what's always interesting about um, the Souls games is how how the 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 options the game gives you, where to go next, and plan routes. I really like that aspect of the game um, a lot. That you can, I don't know, in in, in Dark Souls one, for example, well, the same in two. If you beat the tutorial boss or the first two bosses, you have so many options in these games where to go next if you really want. You can even challenge the, to some degree, um, where you want to go next. And sometimes it's really uh, difficult to get there early. You can, I don't know, good example, uh, getting to Quilak as your basically second boss in the game if you want. It's uh, totally doable. And I really en enjoy this aspect that the world is so, so so well designed and connected, that you um you you know okay if I go there I find this weapon there which I can use and I drop down there, um take this path here and then I will uh then I fight this boss and then go down this route probably will take a few tries but, and just just thinking about where you can go can already be a challenge because you go, can go into areas that you are not supposed to be yet, but you still can beat them if you know how. That's what I really appreciate about this game. It's just a huge amount of freedom you have in it. Yeah, the first game really did that one well. I don't think that was ever surpassed by yeah. the other games in the series. But... I mean, sometimes uh, people say that you can't do this to that degree in Dark Souls um, 2, but if you think about it, if you... Um, start if you just take one first boss as a tutorial boss either the um, last giant or the, um, the the dragon rider then you have so many options where to go like you can get a fragrant branch of your for example that's an item that um, unpetrifies um, people that there's sometimes pe petrified people that block a path you can um, find this item and basically get them back to normal and then move along that path and if you know where those items are to find now to get them fast you can totally um, unlock a lot of options where to go next. I, I really like like this exploring aspect of the game. I think they, Dark Souls usually does exploring pretty well. And I think the third game, even though it does a lot of other things great, it does this not that well, if you know what I mean. Yeah. yeah so yeah, that's why I was saying kind of like yeah, every game in the series kind of has its high points. and Yeah, totally. Especially um, randomizer runs can be quite uh, funny in this game. I did like uh, last year um, Dark Souls 1 randomizer run with like a 40% chance that every normal enemy is a random boss. <laughs> that was, uh, was a weird experience. I was watching someone streaming that and I was thinking, I didn't have a lot of interest before that, but kind of seeing that made me think maybe I do want to try a randomizer at some point. In fact, I think it was... Um, Happy Hob, you guys oh, yeah. I don't know. Could imagine. He, incidentally, he—that's the guy who got uh, the, um, uh, the 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 cease and desist notice thing from the uh, the Tolkien yeah, yeah. State, from I the Tolkien uh, from I think <laughs> Tolkien Enterprises. The the um, why was that? I didn't hear about this. Um, so there's a streamer called Happy Hobbit. Once he was called, now he's called Happy Hob, and because yeah, right. of the name. Yeah, no, exactly, and um. He streams Dark Souls and he's famous for doing no hit run. So he plays through one game or sometimes um, all the games back to back without getting hit once. That's basically um, his thing. He also got the record on this and I don't know. It's really impressive what he does. He has like inhuman amount of patience to get this. Mm. And he's also really good at the game. I have to admit this. No, he knows what he's doing. Well, you'd have to be, wouldn't you? <laughs> yeah, yeah definitely. I like Dark Souls, but I don't like it that much. <laughs> <laughs> I don't like it. I don't think I'd like any game that much. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. And um, at some point, he got like this cease and desist from, um, hmm. from the uh, talking because he called himself a hobbit. And that is, of course, a trademark name. Maybe that trademark is a complex a law topic, which we won't uh, cover here. But for example, if he would have a shirt with Happy Hop on it and sell it as merchandise, he would uh, value, he would, um, um, he violate, that's the word, he would violate a um, trademark mm -hmm. law with it. Because of course, only licensed partners are allowed to make merchandise with Hobbit on it, for example. That there was also yeah. a... Yeah, well, we, we have some friends in YouTube. Yeah, exactly, on YouTube the problem, there was a yeah. channel called... Um, uh, history of Middle Earth, and it got pretty big. 
and relatively big for our um, Cosmos. And they also got a cease and desist and had to ne change um, their, their, their channel name. Now they're called History of Ages. Shout outs to you guys. I don't know whether you and I were smart or not to choose names that had nothing to do with Tolkien. Yeah. <laughs> it was an accident for me, to be honest. Mm. But yeah, it, uh, definitely smart. Because that stuff can be scary. At least, um, yeah, they only had to change like their their brand, which is of course scary if you have a YouTube channel and so on. But and a lot of um, stuff to do. But they, they don't not. I think they did not get sued or anything. Just was like, dude, change this. That is, you have this amount of time. Kind of interesting how this is connected. Also, always wanted to make a video about. Um, how um, Tolkien is related to Dark Souls or uh, maybe has some inspiration on it. For mm. example, there's a place called um, Anno Londo in uh, Dark Souls 1. And uh, Arnor, uh, or Anor is, of course, without the uh, Arnor, is um, also sun, basically, in Elvish. And it's also a place of the sun where um, the Lord of cinder or sunlight uh, resides and so on and then um, in dark souls 3 there is a place called um Irisil and ethil is um the moon and it's also the moon place it's uh, kind of fascinating that there are little aspects like these but yeah maybe um, we should uh, move on a little bit um to um do then some justice here because probably um, does not play that many uh, games and if we now move on maybe we should talk <laughs> about um we have two games on the list i definitely want to talk about that's first of all loop hero and star wars knights of the old republic now you said you uh, replayed it recently um yeah i i am playing it recently i'm playing it currently um yeah it's a it's a game that i have like um a long-standing relationship with it's, it's like a game that i replay every few years um i have a few like that um, but it's, I think, probably more than any other game, uh, particularly the, the sequel, actually, um, is probably the game that inspired me to want to become a games developer. Um, and it was because of how good the writing was in the second game. There's a there's a video on YouTube, I was talking about this recently with Helen, actually. Um, there's a video on YouTube about um, the character of Kraya in the second game. Um yeah. who is just the best written character in a game. <laughs> and she's she's one of those characters that kind of um, makes you think about game writing and, and how good it can be, you know. Um, when, when I went to university, I studied uh, computer game design with a specialization in story development. I wanted to be a games writer and it didn't didn't quite work out that way, but but I think possibly this game is more responsible for that change in my life, um, for me wanting to do that, because the second game is just, it's just, it's it's a shame that it was badly rushed through the gate in the end, because it, it came out too early, and years and years later, people fixed it. But yeah, the character of Cryo is just brilliantly written. Uh, the lead writer on that game is probably one of my biggest heroes in the games industry, is Chris Avalone who also was the lead writer for Planescape Torment, which I mentioned earlier. Oh, that was um, interesting. Didn't know that. And yeah, so he he's still in the industry. And um, I think he's kind of like, a, he's almost like a freelancer now, as, as far as I know. I don't, he, he's not still connected with um, Obsidian Entertainment anymore. He kind of floats around and comes in on different projects and works for different people because um, he's just that highly sought after for his writing ability i think um but yeah kotor um for those who don't know is a single player role-playing game it was released in 2003 i think yes 2003. Um, uh, it was developed by bioware uh, the original and i think it's probably a lot of people's favorite ever star wars game and there's been some really good star wars games over the years yes um there's been quite a few really um x-wing and tie fighter games were good um recently Jedi academy games were good Jedi yeah. knight games were good um recently there's not been as many good ones but <laughs> recently <laughs> jedi uh fallen order i really like that one a lot fallen order yeah i i've watched quite a lot of let's play stuff of that and i think i played it at my nephew's house once or 
maybe I didn't. I don't know. Um, yeah, there's another Souls like incidentally. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, true. <laughs> yeah, it's similar actually. Yeah. All connected. Um, but I think at the top of the pile is still Kotor, just for just for its Star Warsness. Uh, <laughs> is it did Star Wars better than any other game? I think um, there there are probably other games that are just as good in other ways, but because the gameplay isn't actually that great, you know, it's clunky D twenty um, kind of phase based game that is kind of real time with pause turn based style. So it's not quite turn based. It's kind of like um, like I said, they call it real time with pause. Yeah, real time is kind of like in the in the CRPG world. Um, is it like the old Baldur's Gate games and that kind of thing? Yeah, or? kind of like that. Yeah, yeah. Uh, exactly. It's three. It's a three D game though. It's not. It's not um, like an isometric two D game like Baldur's Gate is. Um, and it's just just got a great story. If you like if you like Star Wars, it's the story is going to appeal to you because it's the first game is it feels very classic star wars it feels very yeah. like um a new hope or um return of the jedi star wars yeah whereas this this nice sec game. the sequel is a lot darker and it feels a lot more like a kind of um yeah, empire, more strikes, like the em empire strikes back star wars like yeah. it feels it feels darker in that way um but it even it goes a step beyond where the movies go in terms of darkness because it's it's kind of, it's almost like a deconstruction of the Star Wars mythos. Like it's 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 like it's been written in order to deconstruct Star Wars and particularly particularly the Force. Um, the main um, antagonist or the main villain at the, which you fight at the end of the game, um, she, her objective is to kill the Force itself because she hates the fact that the force seems to drive events and cause suffering on such a scale because of this kind of cycle of the dark side becoming too powerful and then the light side fighting back and and basically the story of the movies right yeah exactly um and i i just fell in love with that idea i think i thought it was brilliant <laughs> yeah it's, it's a really um, fun, it's especially it's an unusual idea like we're yeah, not expect this in a star wars game it's almost a bit philosophical if you want it well, is, it, it is. is. And and it was still a great Star Wars game, you know, the lore was really, really good and there was, you know, there was Wookiees and there was bounty hunters and there was huts and there was, you know, there was all the Star Wars stuff done really well and there was a love for the lore there. But it was just also a brilliant deconstruction of Star Wars in terms of like the philosophical writing element of how the movies are made. Um, and how you know they are Joseph Campbell's um, uh, um, the hero with a thousand yeah faces. yeah yeah exactly yeah um, you know the monomyth that's the word the I'm monomyth of. yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> sorry I'm running out of words here but yeah so that's what I'm playing at the moment you asked me in um, preparation for this what am I playing so that's what I'm playing I play a lot of retro games <laughs> yeah. and I have, I have several that I play every few years like that. And then I have, like, I, I will look for old games that I haven't played before because why not? You know, um, for me, certain games don't age. I don't care about graphics. Yeah. That's, that's I, I want, I want to play classic games. I mean, there, there definitely is uh, in the indie sector movement for, retro looking games sometimes they really look uh, good but also try to to catch the the dated style a bit i guess the mm -hmm. the early 2000s um are sometimes a bit skipped because mm -hmm. uh yeah simply because the technology wasn't there like if we think about the, the super nintendo era it's often like that was the the, the golden age the pinnacle of 2d um yeah, art so... basically, and that is early 3D where everything had to people had to find out stuff. We are now at the there, there are a, there are a lot of games nowadays that try to emulate the kind of 8 bit era, the like the 2D games, but I mean, Loop Hero does it yeah, really, exactly. doesn't it? I mean, the 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 game the music is 8 bit style music, and the graphics are in that style, even though they're 
way beyond what you could actually achieve on a NES or whatever. But, yeah, but, but as long um, as the, the gameplay is good, like that, that, that all doesn't matter. And yeah. I agree with you. I also replayed it like, I don't know, two years ago or something, or three years ago. It's not a game that I, we play that frequently, but um, I, mm -hmm. I had really a good time with um, Knights of the Old Republic and good memories. Kind of surprised that it came out like uh, 17, 18 years ago. It's really, <laughs> time moves by really fast, but. Um, I don't there's know a, how it is. It's, it's just a really why... good Star Wars game. It really feels mm. Star Warsy, and you feel um, impactful. You have an interesting story. You have choices uh, to some degree, and it's a really a uh, fun game in that regard. And there's also a really Actually, cool plot twist. Oh yeah, sorry. Oh no, go ahead. It sounds like you're still in the middle of something. No, no, I I just finished up uh, my my sentence. The the plot twist is very Star Wars too, isn't it? It's very yeah, it um... is. It's not quite Luke, I am your father, but it's it's along those lines, though, isn't it? Yeah, it is. <laughs> um, well, coming from the perspective of having never played these games, um, so it's like writing aside, because you could argue that's you know right, good writing is timeless or whatever, but mm -hmm. um, not having any kind of nostalgia connection to the games having originally played them, from a total kind of gameplay package perspective, is this still playable to someone, would you say? Uh, to this day, sort of trying going back and looking at it, kind of thing. Mm, I think it definitely uh, is, but of course there is some 2003 clunkiness in this game. Mm. Yeah, agreed. To put it that way, and of course, I, I guess you are also a very gameplay focused um, player pawn. So, um, I yeah, the gameplay is not bad from this game. It's not like this, but if you um, expect like dark souls uh, quality and be mind blown by it and that's probably not the case but it, it's no. solid i would say it's still solid and it it holds up okay but it's it i don't even at its at the time i don't think the gameplay was the main pull yeah. of the game really it was definitely not bad but there were definitely uh, other strengths in this in this game but i feel, i think it's it's still playable if you're not um shocked by the graphics or by a bit of 2003 clunkiness in the gameplay yeah because i'm just sort of thinking there's a lot of older games which are great but still just a, because of how they are a bit hard to go back to i'm just kind of wondering where that fits on that sort of spectrum but sounds like there's still things of value here so yeah and it's uh, fully voiced that's also <laughs> a good thing <laughs> i mean it's, in terms of gameplay one of the things that's it, uh, it does quite well as it uses skills quite well so you you build an rpg character and you can't you can't be the master of everything when it comes to the skills stuff so you um you kind of you have to either build your computer use skill or your repair skill or your demolition skill etc and you can't really have them all necessarily um so i think that stuff is still re really really good um the fighting isn't yeah. really and that's cool great. characters um and there are other games from the same era that do you know character building better as well so it's they hold up okay but they're not amazing <laughs> yeah Ponce, did you play um jedi fallen order by any chance no i have not i sound i think it's the kind of thing i'm gonna probably play eventually but i haven't gotten around to it okay yeah, that was my uh, game of the year uh, when it came out. I really, really, yeah, I really liked it. I it was basically like a mixture between Jedi Knight and uh, Dark Souls, and it wasn't perfect. It had some technical issues here and there, but uh, I I was convinced by it. It it definitely I can see that it, probably not everyone will like it, but I enjoyed it immensely and uh, was really really a great game for me. I thought the cutscenes were quite good. I haven't played it. I've only watched some. I've only watched a let's play of it. Um, yeah, uh, the story was decent, I guess. I liked the characters too. That they, in my opinion, did uh, pretty well. I liked the uh, levels. It's a bit Metroidvania esque with Dark Souls elements uh, in it. And when you uh, fight, you can basically upgrade your move set. I like that a lot because there were some pretty neat ideas in the move set that you could try to master. For example, there's um, one thing that you can get into your moveset where you have to press 
like a, a dodge button and if you time it perfectly you you dodge um, basically not i'm not sure if it can dodge any attack but most attacks and you get a bit of force back when you do it but it's very very uh, timing dependent and that i really like that that little idea there and you get better at using the skills and so on especially on the higher difficulties has multiple of those it can become quite difficult too for like mainstream game at least and i don't know i really, I really uh, enjoyed it of course not an rpg it's like i said more more uh, metroidvania with some dark souls ideas mixed into it and reminds me more of jedi knight which i uh, also always liked like jedi 2 is uh and jedi, mm -hmm. jedi knight academy and so on really great games too my opinion yeah was it uh jedi academy it was the third night game i think it's one yeah. of the few um star wars games that i actually played i, I recall enjoying that quite a bit yeah that was uh pretty cool i even played the first one it was one of the first Star Wars games I no it's probably not true probably X well, it was among the first games I played and <laughs> it was also that that game was weird like it had these gigantic levels that were like I don't know sometimes there were was like a little um exhaustion what do you call the pipe uh where you got into to get to the next level and it was so hard to see the level was gigantic and sometimes yeah. finding the exit of the level was really really difficult but the scale felt weird in those games yeah well, exactly the scale was like sometimes off but i really liked it it also i think had a weird engine bug that on there was some abilities that basically had had an explosion like a bla like a i don't know yeah like a rocket launcher or one of those energy weapons or this this force energy ball you could shoot when you went for the dark side and if you would shoot those at a high distance the blast radius somehow scaled not well with the depths of the screen so the enemies could fly pretty far away from you that sometimes fell, led to very funny situations so i saw some stormtroopers in the distance so i tried to make as much distance as possible shoot my um aoe field in them and then that was then, then they would just fly over the screen it was kind of funny and they also had like a weird um add-on and i never compl uh, i could never beat all the levels in it i had to cheat and go to the next level i couldn't find the exits it was just so difficult <laughs> But which game was this one uh, that was the first jedi knight called dark oh, the first one okay. yeah dark forces 2 and the add-on was a uh, mysterious of the Sith or something it was called came out like 1995 or something like this 1996 i'm not sure long long time ago but yeah that is uh so do we do we want to uh is there something we need to left to say to um knights of old republic no, I mean, I've given my quite lengthy review, um, and I think we've said all we can say, really. So, um, yeah, I don't know, maybe um, we just blitz through um, some of the uh, topics, like uh, Guilty Gear Strive the Better. Um, I think Ponce played it uh, on his channel too. Yeah, I, I can be pretty brave about that. I don't have a hell of a lot to say about it. It's pretty concise, my opinion, so... Yeah, I probably will agree with you. Um, we 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 could use this to um, praise the netcode a bit, because, in my opinion, more games should have netcode like this. Yeah, that's really all there is to say. About, I think about the bill. Well, there's a couple things, but the netcode was great. Um, unusually good for a fighting game. Hopefully, that means fighting games going forward all have better netcode. Maybe if that's not going to happen, but we can pretend. Um, the lobby system was terrible. Sounds like they're fixing it because uh, they delayed the game, if I recall correctly. Someone told me that, and I was like, because the lobby is terrible? And I looked into it, and yeah, that's what it was, and the servers were unstable. My only issue with that game really is a personal one. I just didn't like anyone on the roster, and that's kind of a big thing for a fighting game, but that doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad game. It just means nothing clicked with me in terms of a character. Okay. Yeah, maybe, the, I guess, in the full release, there were some uh, more characters and... Maybe we'll, there there will be something, but yeah, I, I can't uh, agree more. It's it's the lobby system was really surprisingly um, bad for Guilty Gear. Like it was it, pretty atrocious. Yeah. It was yeah, it, it was infuriating. It just 
you, you you want to fight, you maybe lose a fight, but very closely and just want to rematch right now. But now you have to go through this annoying lobby system. I think they disabled the rematch function for the beta so people could get more different games to test things out, whatever. But uh, still, was was not ideal. My experience with the lobby was not that great. Sometimes it didn't work, sometimes kicked you out. Just um, And the animations going on there, just wasting your time was uh, not that great. But yeah, the netcode of this game um, is kind of special because at the beginning, like hours ago, we <laughs> talked about a, a bit about this rollback netcode and um, what this what rollback netcode basically does is it has a concept of that the game predicts what the enemy does next, and it predicts that it does the same as it did before, and as a result you can basically um, build, let me explain um, this further in a moment, you can build a game that has, it feels like it has no delay or very, very little delay, it almost plays like you would play it locally. So people might ask, okay, but if it just predicts that it does the same thing as last frame, what, what if, if, it, if, if, it, if it is wrong? And then the, the rollback basically comes into play because you have a lot of uh, wind up animation and so on. The game just um, checks what is uh, going, uh, what's what's going on. Like if a move has like I don't know, it, to to hit you, it needs let's say ten frames or something. Um, ten frames, uh, one frame is um, one se almost one seventeenth of a second. No, seventeen uh, is one sixtieth of a second. Seventeen milliseconds. So ten frames are one hundred seventy milliseconds. And as you can hear, that number that's quite a lot. Even if you take um, half of it, like um, let's say around uh, 90 milliseconds away, um, the game basically rolls back and changes this. This can look sometimes in extreme situations a bit weird or um, these, these corrections that the game has con constantly do, but you actually won't notice if you have like a decent connection to up to let's say 150 to 200 milliseconds. Usually you, at least in this game, you don't really notice. In addition, as mentioned, um, the game also has a buffer, like two frames or three frames of a delay. And um, that, that helps to smooth things out. And I played against people from the United States um, with like 150 to one to 200 milliseconds delay. And it still was totally fine playing. It was not a horrible experience at all, even at these high um, latencies. And that is just, in my opinion, a really impressive and also really innovative approach to how, you, how to design your netcode in, in this regard. And it works so well, and it, it's around for quite some time. Some Western games have adapted to this rollback netcode, like Killer Instinct um, was one of the bigger games that had it. I think Mortal Kombat has it too. But some, for some reason, Japanese developers um, didn't like uh, the technology too much, it seems, or I don't know the reasons. They want to design their own um, net, rollback netcode. And a lot of Japanese games simply have not that great of an online experience um, due to this. And yeah, this is now not the biggest game ever, but it's definitely a well-known um, game Guilty Gear, game series. And the hope is and that games in future take um, an example of this and follow this rollback netcode trend or generate a netcode trend at all to rollback and that we get good upcoming fighting games with um, fantastic uh, netcode and online experiences. Like I, I personally play um, so Calibre 6 and I can say the netcode is not that great in that game it's really sometimes infuriating yeah things better improve because at this point I'm not going to play a fighting game with bad netcode again ever I'm, I've done my time I'm not doing yeah. it again you can totally understand that because especially now in the pandemic when you can't go to local events when you um, don't have those uh, tournaments at a local and so on you are you rely on online and if you neglected your online um stuff for quite some time then yeah it's, that's not 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 a the feedback won't be that great i guess and it's a really good time that um, games like these come out on the also plus side i have to admit that a lot of um like at least mechanically decent fighting games came out um, in the last uh, few years like it feels it was a time where i felt fighting games are dead but um almost 
but now um, a lot of great fighting games are coming out and um, continue to coming out and when the online experience enhances i see a bright future there not sure if pawns has anything to add not really no um i mean i'm fairly new is not i guess the right term but i only really started playing fighting games uh, with dragon ball fighters so okay i don't have that big i don't know history uh, with the genre really i would say as I know I played the um, casually. I always played a, a little bit, but um, getting deeper into it was with maybe Soul Calibur Four or something. Then I like met um, frequently with friends, and uh, we played locally against each other, and then um, got better and so on. And checked frame mm -hmm. data and so on. Yeah, I've always associated uh, associated mentally fighting games as being better played locally with friends in in person. Um, I played. Yeah, I played. Uh, I think the last fighting game I actually owned was Street Fighter Four. So it's <laughs> going no. back a while. Um, I played that online a bit, and it was unplayable, really. Um, <laughs> yeah, having a, a good local. Or maybe scene I was just bad. Can... But... <laughs> Sorry. Go ahead. Oh, I was gonna say, having a good local scene where there's just uh, like a fighting game thing, and going to that consistently really ruins the online experience because you'll go out to a thing, you know, where there's like 20, 30 people gathered and all sitting around playing fighting games. And then it's great. And then you go home and play online. And it's like, now this feels even worse because you know what it can be like. So I don't know, maybe because it's really late. Let's, let's maybe talk briefly about the nature of Middle Earth book that I'm, I'm actually pretty interested in what Dan has to uh, say about um, that. Yeah, um... maybe you should explain to Pons uh, what uh, the big deal with this book too. So, <laughs> yeah, I've no idea. Yes, what this is. so <laughs> it's a new it's a new Tolkien book, which um, we haven't gotten any new original material in years and years and years. Um, but it's new, unreleased material which we've never got before. It's probably going to be essays and notes and things, and it's there won't be any whole new stories, but. But it's a uh, it's new material. Um, we know that there's going to be some Numenor stuff in there, um, which is interesting because that is going to be a setting which we're going to see in the Amazon Prime show. Um, and yeah, I'm really excited to get new stuff. Um, I'm excited to talk about it as well. Now that I have all these wonderful Lord of the Rings Tolkien friends, <laughs> I never had before. Um, <laughs> And yeah, the news about, about that is is that the uh, release date has been pushed back from June till September. Sadly, yeah. But... It's um, yeah, kind of uh, interesting. Here's the uh, book in case people wonder how it uh, would look. It's uh, kind of interesting. In, Ger in, in German Amazon, it was listed still for, I think, July for quite some time, but they also changed it. And I looked at another bookstore and they have also the September date. What is What I did not know, which is that there will be a translation of this book in German. So it uh. seems that maybe they still some of the translation. And I'm not sure. I have no information on this. I uh, aren't ready or maybe some of, the, some of the book needed more work. And that's the reason why the translation... Uh, translations also need to be uh, pushed back a bit and so there is uh, a delay yeah, I don't, needed for don't know it. if they've given a reason for pushing it back up they? yeah I, I, I don't think they've said I, and i can only speculate about it but of course if we get like um unpublished um tolkien materials after i don't know when when was the last book that came out that has actually um stuff in it that we um didn't know about like i would assume um, that must have been the last. Um, that must have history of the of the Hobbit, yeah. maybe. Um, well, that does that have original Tolkien material in it? Mm, yeah, I think so. But I haven't read that one. I don't know. I was yeah, going to say people. I was going to yeah. say it would be Peoples of Middle Earth, which was in the nineties. Yeah, exactly. But... So, so basically, I'm not. Sure, I'm not sure when. Um, do you know out of your head when history of the Hobbit came out? I think no, I early two thousands or something, or maybe also late nineties. Wait a moment, yeah, I, just, I can look it up. However, it's of course very exciting if we um, if we um, get finally, finally, after such a long time, uh, new um, new material that we haven't uh, read yet. It came out 2007, so for over 13 years, basically um, nothing 
groundbreaking new um, that we even I, I guess we didn't even know that it, stuff existed that wasn't published yet it's I guess a somewhat big surprise you have to think that this is probably the last yeah that might of be orig of original material that we'll ever get as well I exactly think. so that is um, like a huge deal and um, I heard that it uh, covers like um, was it uh, like nature li um, immortality of the elf and stuff like this Mm -hmm. And that are, of course, often very interesting uh, topics, especially when we do like like videos about the law. Often people ask um, like some of the more let's call it extreme questions, like what, why is this character this? How does it work? Why are the elves immortal? Something like this. Um, mm. And why, why do they like trees? Yeah, why is it like trees, for example? <laughs> And uh, this might give him some new answers. So I'm, I'm very excited to see what is in it. Also a bit intimidated as um, someone who might have to cover it. And then and that, that's, that's kind of puts a bit, bit of pressure on you, I feel. But I don't know how you feel about it. Mm. And Pauls, you asked, you asked earlier um, about the alchemical uh, makeup of the ring. Like um, what is the kind of exact... Um, Met Metal, oh, metallurgical yes. makeup of the ring yeah. i can confirm it's actually it's one part cruelty two parts malice and one part will to dominate all life so, <laughs> oh, of course right thank you yeah no problem that is uh how it uh works so and um, that is uh, might might be interesting i'm pretty cu curious how other people uh, will cover it probably it's hard to say how much material um, there will be in it that is um, actually new. But... Yeah, I don't know how I'm going to deal with it when it comes out. Um, I'll probably do a book review of it on my channel, I would think, and read through it again and again until I figure out what I can mine it for for good video material, I guess. Yeah. Um, I think um, my friend Corey Olson, Professor Corey Olson, will be covering it on his class as well. So I'll be watching that with interest. Yeah, um, he he does a Mythgard Academy series on. It's like a podcast series that he does, and um, they, uh, if you if you are a financial donor of the university, um, he's a he's a Tolkien scholar who has an online university. If you're a donor, then you can vote on which books they cover. So they'll almost certainly cover that book um, in the in their podcast live class. Um, so I'll be watching that with interest because I'm sure he'll have some thoughts on it. Yeah, for sure. Um, so is is there like just like a vault full of Tolkien stuff, like snippets of writings that they've been slowly doling out every couple of decades, and this is the last of it, kind of thing, or? Yeah, there's kind of um, there's a big collection of writings, and um, I think only certain people have access to it. Um, the editor of this book is the I think I don't know if he's the president or the like leader or whatever he is, what his like position is, but he's he's involved with the Elvish Language Fellowship, so he's kind of like a, a scholar who's involved with the um, the study of the invented languages. Um, so he he's closely connected, I I would guess, with the Tolkien estate, and that's why he was selected to edit it. Um, actually, one thing that I did think was um, maybe I'll try and get him on my channel for an interview at some point. No, oh, that would be pretty cool. I certainly know people who know him, so probably probably get him. Maybe I'll ask you to co-host actually, Chris, if you're interested. Yeah, for sure. If I can if I can make that happen. Um, not sure if I can or not, but. <laughs> Yeah, sure. People like if you like publish a book, I can imagine that you're quite busy. If it the release date mm. is was was just moved, so we probably have things to do. But yeah, can um, we could be interested in this too. I mean, yeah. you you've made quite a study of the languages, or at least of the pronunciation, haven't you? <laughs> yeah, phonology. In order to so. in order to get your uh, pronunciations right in your videos. Exactly. I just I just correct myself when I realise that I've got something wrong retroactively. <laughs> I'll next time remember to correct it. Yeah. Um, it's pretty interesting uh, in that way. Do you expect anything? Um, I don't know. Let's call it big in it. <laughs> like getting new information, maybe another um, essay on the origin of the orcs or something. 
Yeah, no, I'm not expecting, you know, um, uh, who is Tom Bombadil? You know, I'm not expecting no, to yeah. get that or something like that, you know. <laughs> um, unanswered questions like that. Um, it's probably going to be little bits of details of things that we never would have even thought to ask. <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, there was a there was a, um a, there was a blurb that was online about the book that was it made reference to flora and fauna of um Numenor, which oh, we yeah. already know quite a lot about because we already know um well we know quite a bit about what trees are on. Yeah, Numenor. exactly. There's a mention of course, some trees, the origin of Athelas. Yeah, and so on. And the um the flowers that are in Lothlorien as well. Um, I yeah, can't remember those na the name of us. <laughs> yeah, no, never me. <laughs> no, 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 we, so we already know quite a lot about that. So it's it's interesting to know what more we can find out about that. Really. Um, yeah. And like you say, the I think the really interesting thing is the stuff about the elves and about immortality and so on. Um, exactly. That is uh, usually like there can be some surprising insights into how Tolkien imagined that. He spent a lot of time thinking about the details, yeah. especially after the Lord of the Rings. So he wrote the Silmarillion. Um, well, he didn't. He wrote he he wrote several versions of the Silmarillion yeah. prior to the, the Lord of the Rings, um, and it was really his life's work, really, um, to create this legendarium and this mythology that um, he created. And the Lord of the Rings kind of threw a spanner in the works of a lot of that because he kind of wrote it and then things didn't quite fit with what he wrote in the lord of the rings so he had to go back and change things yeah and he was a stickler for the details when it came to that so some of his best work i think came from him cross-examining his legendarium by writing new fiction um so he would write stuff like um like the muriel and um uh um Finway stuff um yeah, that's in yeah. Morgoth's Ring. Um that was a kind of dialogue that he wrote that was um a, a discussion between the Valar, who are like the gods of Tolkien. Um and it was, you know, we got characters that we've always had names of them, but we've never had dialogue from them, and we got new dialogue from them in that section. And he wrote that because he was trying to fix a problem in the Silverillion kind yeah, of Yeah, exactly. If that makes sense. It's like, I don't know, he <laughs> really went into a lot of detail with um, some aspects. It's uh, always the, fascinating. The the theological and metaphysical stuff that he wrote um, as a consequence to the Lord of the Rings, is, some of it is just fascinating. Like. <laughs> and it's like, um, probably Pawn asks himself, uh, what are they talking about? But uh, yeah. <laughs> like, like, for example, there is, um, what happened, because elves don't die, and if they die, they can basically come back if they were good elves. And um, what happens, though, if one elf is dead and won't want to come back and the other wants to marry again? That's basically a question mm. Tolkien discussed. It's a short yeah. version of it. And what, uh, yeah, and what the outcome was is that they decided that he could have a posthumous divorce, basically. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but uh, the, the consequence is that the, the one part has to stay dead, basically. <laughs> and yeah, um, we'll expect something, little details like these I would expect from uh, this book. That, like, only a different, a, a different aspect, of course, but... So elves can self res. Um, not self rest directly. So when they die, they go into a place called the Halls of uh, Mandos. It's basically uh, yeah, the the underworld for the dead souls, if you want, and has different sections. That's a, co a very complicated topic. Let's not go too deep into this. And they have to stay there for a while, but then they have the option to basically get re embodied. So, if, for example, um, an elf dies in in the film for example in helm's deep we have the elf dying there it's um, mm -hmm. different in the book um he would basically go to the halls of mandos and then because he was a good elf get re-embodied so the out of his spirit the, a new body is um basically created that 
his old body and um, he can, uh, I think it depends on the version, basically uh, repossess it. And um, then he walks on this place where the halls of Manos, that's on the West continent. So Middle Earth is the continent in the middle, and there's a West continent called Aman. It's also complicated. Everything in Tolkien universe is complicated. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> and um, yeah, he has to basically stay there. There are some exceptions when uh, they're, they're, like there's one elf who left Middle Earth after he got uh, reembodied again, Lord of Findel, he's in Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. But and that is also a complicated topic. Uh, it's, it's always fascinating when you discuss Tolkien law in in a very deep uh, matter. You always have to say, yeah, that's complicated. I And then I have to get sidetracked and talk half an hour about something else that is distantly related to it. And yeah. It's... <laughs> yeah, everything's connected to everything else. And yeah. it's like, it's the most fleshed out fictional universe, I think, ever, really. I, I can't think of anything that's... You know, it's got its own calendars and it's got its own languages and it's got its own, um, like even the, the cos how languages and develop cosmology and history and like lineages of all the kings in all the kingdoms yeah. and um, history. Like he wrote etymological essays about just the names of the rivers in Lord of the Rings. <laughs> you know, um, it's just. It's crazy, actually. You know, I, I say it to people all the time, like in my in my real life. Uh, people ask me, you know, um, what's the deal with Tolkien? And I, I say, you know, he was nuts. <laughs> <laughs> That's the plain fact. You know, he, he was driven to write all this stuff over decades and he just never stopped. Yeah. Um, I was talking recently to um, my friend and yours, the Clueless Fan Girl, well, a couple of months ago now, through probably three or four months ago now, maybe, I don't know, about Galadriel. We did a podcast about Galadriel, and he wrote pretty much nearly on his deathbed, he wrote stuff about Galadriel, like, weeks before he died. He was still writing about his character. That's really... He was dedicated when it comes to his uh, universe. Mm -hmm. Really dedicated. Yeah, I, I can't think of another fictional universe that has as much uh, complexity. At least by a, single, by a single writer that's... Uh... Probably well. No. no. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you can say like the Marvel Comics universe, but that's over decades of like yeah, exactly hundreds of different writers, basically. Yeah, all these Star Wars novels, or I don't know, there yeah. maybe uh, examples, but it, it's it's really impressive how fleshed out it is, and at the same time, he never finished the stuff in his lifetime and brought it like out completely. It, his son had to. Um, basically um, put his writings together in a, and select them in a way that it fits the Lord of the Rings and then he released it as a, a Silmarillion. And mm. it's fascinating. He was very transparent and released all the other notes of Tolkien he had access to um, over time too and commented and um, sought them out. It must be a pretty really difficult task to, to do this, like working through your um, father's notes over from, from literally a century and... Uh, almost a century and uh, no, let's say half a century and puzzling everything together deciphering um, one of the handwritten notes and so on it's really really impressive what he did and he released like 12 books of basically notes and versions of Tolkien that he has and multiple other um, things were released like history of the hobbit and so on it's uh, unfinished tales and... unfinished tales i forgot that one and the letters of tolkien and there's yeah, just the so much in it um during his own lifetime people wrote to him often and he would write quite lengthy letters with new lore that he'd invent in order to answer their questions <laughs> um so a lot of those are published as well yes um, it, it, it's massive. so this so this book um you know it will have it will have some gems in it for sure um yeah it may well have some stuff that is we... going to be boring and dry as well, because um, I'm not, I'm not going to lie and say that everything that's been published is gripping fiction. It's interesting <laughs> to people who are, are into this universe. Yeah, definitely. The the Tolkien uh, fans are definitely um, excited for this, I guess. So, mm -hmm. we'll see more I like about the this. concept of uh, errata via fan mail. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it wouldn't happen now. It wouldn't happen. Um, I don't know if writers probably still do get fan mail, but 
I don't know. There's, there's, I mean, there's no, there's no one like Tolkien really anyway. So I don't know whether other writers would write back in the same way and create new stuff. <laughs> yeah, it's really impressive. Sometimes way. he goes to the letters and he wrote like I don't know, a six pages letter as an answer. So it's really. <laughs> He would always approach it in in a way where he was like he was doing a reading of his own work as well. So it, when people would ask him questions, it, it would be a case where he would go back and revisit what he wrote and then try to come up with his answer based on that, as opposed to somebody like um, J.K. Rowling, who will say, you know, this is what I always intended. And she'll present it as if that's what she always intended but actually she's making it up on the fly um <laughs> but then i don't think she responds to fan mail i think you know we don't get stuff like that from her unless it's in an interview really no uh, that was quite impressive about talking we would discuss stuff very in deeply in his letters and explain and the development of it. it's, it's really impressive but yeah i would say um It's really late. I almost mm -hmm. must apologize that to you to keep you here. Yeah, in it's, almost three, so long. it's almost three o'clock for you, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, it's almost three o'clock for me. <laughs> it's, it's, it was a ton of fun, I have to admit. Um, You're going to have a lot of editing to get this down to a reasonable length for a podcast. Possibly. Yeah, we just we just uploaded it and people <laughs> people uh, watch it anyway, I hope. <laughs> Maybe not. We will uh, see how this works out. But... Maybe release it in two parts, actually. Yeah, maybe it should make a two-part uh, episode of the first episode. It was pretty long, but it's really difficult. I, I didn't, I didn't look at the at the clock for quite some time. I, I totally lost track of how how late it is. I just expected we start. In my mind, we started like an hour ago or so. But yeah, so um, I would say um, we we should wrap up, right? So now we have the um, I have the honor to um, have this little um, shout out section, basically a section where you can say um, where, we, where people find you, what you're doing um, at the end. Um, I have a little um, screen for that prepared. Uh, I would say we start with Pawns. Yeah, twitch.tv slash Pawns. I'm here most days. I pretend to have a schedule and I'm supposed to start in the mornings, uh, but oftentimes I don't. It's probably not worth watching, but I, I'm here anyway. Also, I promised, uh, because right before this started, my channel artist wanted me to do something. And then I was like, I haven't podcast thing in seven minutes. Why don't I just shout you out instead? So shout outs to Moon Bunny, <laughs> aka Lettuce. Because I promised to do that. And uh, yeah, hopefully I added something to this podcast other than my incessant complaining about things <laughs> no i think it was uh, great having you here i hope you enjoyed your time um uh, next would be uh, of course um uh, dan let me see find your card there it is okay dan it's your turn yes so uh, my youtube channel is voice of geekdom um i also do pretty much exclusively lord of the rings content um or tolkien content um, actually, I, I have a long-running series which I've been, um, you know, creating from the start of the channel, which was the Silmarillion Explained series. Which um, basically, I'm going through the Silmarillion roughly chapter by chapter, except for some of the longer chapters I've split up into multiple parts, and giving my summary and giving some extra tidbits of stuff that ties in with the Lord of the Rings or stuff that I've brought in from the history of Middle Earth series, which we were just talking about, um, and kind of explaining concepts and um, examining the text. Um, and as part of that story at that um, series as well, I, um, I feature other creators very often doing little bits of voice acting. So where there's dialogue, um, I'll bring in other creators, which is fun. Um, so definitely check that out. Um, I also do podcasts, which um, are sort of not that regular. They're kind of um, <laughs> whenever I feel like um, I've interviewed a few different people and sometimes I have your discussions. Um, I have a kind of on-off co-host uh, who is Helen, the Clueless Fangirl. She has her own channel as well, so shout-outs to her. Um, she's a good friend of Chris's as well. Another German, 
Um, yeah. <laughs> and um, so I do stuff on her channel sometimes too. Um, and you can find me at, at my YouTube channel, Voice of Geekdom, or on tw I'm on Twitter at Voice of Geek. Okay. Very good. Um, thank you, guys, again, for uh, being here. It was a, a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed it at least a little bit. It was fun for me uh, talking with you, hearing your opinions. We should maybe do this again and um, not lose track of the time. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think you interrupted somebody. Oh, I was going to know. I had fun. Thanks for having me on the show. I appreciate it. Yeah, very nice. i happy that you uh, enjoyed it. Um, yeah, my stuff, yeah, I'm doing talking law stuff for my channel too. People probably already know. I also cover video games, do some, I call it video essays in the widest sense, what I'm doing streaming on Twitch too. But mainly uh, my focus is YouTube. Next, coming up next is like my very late Games of the Year 2020 uh, video, <laughs> which uh, is almost done, come out next week and after that a video about Elrond and there will be a Tolkien reading day video at the end of mm. the month too yeah I forgot to shout that out um so it's going to be the playlist is going to be hosted on my channel but everybody is taking part well everybody everybody that we know in the community is taking part and it's gonna be a big event so yeah um, pretty cool um look out for uh, that and yeah, that basically uh it so Respect to all people sitting through all of this and still being here watching us. Um, that is imp really impressive. I hope, um, dear viewers, you enjoyed this or listeners, you enjoyed this too. Had a, a good time with us. And um, yeah, I have a little final credit scene prepared um, that just uh, can run through. Um, again, thank you to, uh, to you guys. It was really a lot of fun talking with you. I really mean that. And I appreciate a lot that you brought the time here to come, even though I imprisoned you a bit in this podcast, it feels. But yeah, it was uh, really a lot of fun. So uh, thank you uh, for watching and uh, see you people next time. <laughs>